Good morning. Uh, good morning to everyone and uh, welcome to this conference on uh, tech enablers and uh, rising university industry clusters. Welcome to all of you in the room and uh, welcome to the online audience. To our Chinese friends, ni hao. Uh, we <laughs> Don't worry, I won't go any further than that. Um, maybe uh, before we start, uh, first my name is Marilyn Fiaschi, I'm the Managing Director of uh, Science Business, a media and communications company specialized in EU innovation policies and um, specialize in connecting those that make innovation happen. We run a 50-member network of uh, leading research universities, multinationals, including Huawei, and uh, government agencies. Before we start, I just wanted to say a few words about this venue. This is the Solvay Library uh, that was inaugurated in 1902 and uh, with construction was financed by the Belgian industrialist uh, Ernest Solvay. Uh, it was actually the Institute of Sociology of the Free University of Brussels. And this place, this magnificent place, I should say, was designed according to the academic thinking of the time, with in the central area a library, surrounded by multiple study rooms, to encourage students and members of the academic staff to think individually. Well, things have changed, and today we brought all the brains together in the main room to think collectively, uh, with one objective that probably Ernest Solvay would have appreciated, to help Europe innovate. Uh, today's conference, um, that is kindly supported by Huawei Technologies, uh, is twofold. In the morning, we are going to look at the importance of clusters and ICT in, um, for Europe's capacity to innovate and create uh, jobs and growth. Uh, in the afternoon, we will have more of a futuristic debate, uh, looking at why 5G, Internet of Things, big data, the cloud, industry 4.0, can potentially change Europe. You can follow up the debate and feed the debate on Twitter using the hashtag uh, TechClustersEU. You have uh, a live feed here on the screen uh, and to connect. On Twitter, you will need a Wi-Fi code. And for those who haven't managed to connect yet, can we put the Wi-Fi code again on the screen, please? This is uh, Science Space Business. And uh, the password is 181016. All right. Uh, before we kick off, just uh, another practical point throughout the day. We will break uh, several times for networking sessions. And the networking area areas, should I say, are upstairs. And as you can see, this is an open space. So please, when the conference is about to start again, come back to your seats. Uh, and please avoid making noise upstairs. Uh, I think that's it for the, for the practicalities. So without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Ms. Chen Li Fang. Uh, Ms. Chen is a corporate senior vice president and member of the board at Huawei Technologies. Ms. Chen, the floor is yours. Dear Commissioner, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm very honored to join this salon. I think today's salon is like a Roman forum, a place to exchange ideas and gain insight. Uh, I will first talk about my thoughts. Huawei was founded 29 years ago with startup capital of 3,000 US dollars. Today, we provide products and services to 3 billion people around the world. And we have built 
more than 1,500 networks in over 170 countries and regions. How was Huawei able to grow from nothing into what it is today? Uh, I believe there are three factors. First, we have always been customer-centric and innovate based on customer needs. This allows us to continuously create value for customers. Second, we value our dedicated employees and have implemented an effective benefit sharing and distribution system. Under this system, the ratio of returns from labor to returns from capital is three to one. Third, we invest heavily in innovation to develop the best technologies. In the future, we will continue to rely on these success factors. Huawei founder Mr. Ren believes that humanity will enter an intelligent world over the next two or three decades. The depth and breadth of this change will be beyond anything we could ever imagine. Despite such great uncertainties, we will continue to invest more and explore more. The transmission of high-definition images will require cost-effective broadband networks. AI, VR, and AR will need ultra-low network latency. To address these challenges, we need to make breakthroughs in both theory and engineering. Over the past decade, Huawei has invested 38 US, billion US dollars in R&D, and we estimate that our annual R&D spending will, each, will reach 20 billion US dollars by 2020. Of that amount, 30% will be invested in researching and exploring basic and cutting edge technologies. ICT technology is now deeply integrated into every part of society. As such, ICT is no longer a vertical industry. It has become an enabler of digital transformation across all industries. In order to achieve this, the ICT industry must create an open ecosystem that works across regions, industries, and domains. This ecosystem must be a community of common interests where all players survive and thrive on shared success. Huawei is committed to building such an open ecosystem, creating value together with our partners and sharing benefits with them. Our open partnerships with academia and universities, including today's academic salon, are a vital part of this ecosystem. Uh, we work with the University of Surrey in 5G research and with the University of Manchester on application of graphing. We also work with the University of California, Berkeley on joint AI research projects. And we collaborate with the Technical University of Munich on acoustics and the Cambridge University on photonics. We look forward to seeing more partners join us. Together, we will bring more benefits to humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chen. It's very good to hear that uh, Huawei intends to invest so much in research and in exploring cutting-edge techno cutting technologies, and that Huawei is, act is, is that active in building partnerships uh, across Europe. So that will make a perfect transition with the first topic on the agenda, uh, the role of university industry partnerships in regional innovation. And to, uh, to present the topic, to introduce the topic, uh, I would like to ask Tibor Navracic, <coughs> the, the European Commissioner for Education, Culture, Youth and Sport, uh, to give us an insight on why the European Commission considers those partnerships as a high priority. Commissioner Navracic, the floor is yours.
Thank you, Marilyn. Madam Vice President, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Congratulations to Science Business and to Huawei Technologies for organizing this event. And indeed, for putting 10 inspiring examples of digital innovation and its role in boosting regional development in the spotlight. Innovation happens where ideas and experiences collide, where different branches of knowledge interact within or across national borders, and where people with entrepreneurial skills work side by side with those who have frontier knowledge. The cooperation between universities and industry is where these interactions happen and is thus central to driving innovation. Developing this cooperation is a priority for me. It is vital in ensuring Europe's young people can develop the skills and attitudes they need to find fulfilling work and become independent citizens. And this cooperation plays a big part in enabling Europe's regions and cities to make the most of the most precious resource they have, people's brains, talents, and willingness to engage in their communities. Both of these roles are crucial in building a prosperous, competitive, inclusive, and open Europe. That is why I welcome the report on 10 digital clusters in Europe you are presenting here today. I'm particularly pleased to see the report's focus on the local level and on the cities at the forefront of Europe's innovation. We need to develop a better understanding of place-based innovation. We need to know why some cities and regions are successfully integrating their knowledge providers while others are lagging behind. This is critical in helping all of them find approaches and initiatives that suit their particular needs and help them develop. The European Commission is already supporting the entire innovation ecosystem with a number of instruments. In particular, we are working to strengthen cooperation between those driving innovation. Let me give you some examples. First, the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, or EIT. Its knowledge and innovation communities, the KICs, are all about cooperation between academia, research, and business. The aim is to forge a culture of innovation, to promote an entrepreneurial mindset way beyond the respective projects and individuals involved. How? The answer lies in the EIT's unique structure. Although the KICs are pan-European partnerships, they are strongly anchored at local and regional level. Indeed, there are over 30 co-location centers in 15 member states, a network that I want to see expand in the years ahead so that more regions can benefit. Second, we have the Maris Kodowska Curie actions. These are often seen as an instrument primarily for universities and research bodies. However, they also strongly promote cooperation between academia and business. One of the aims is to make researchers more employable in a range of career paths and to foster knowledge transfer. Europe is quite good at deploying its researchers in academia, but less good at doing so in business. Thus, the Maris Kodowska Curie actions promote partnerships between universities and enterprises. And the European Industrial Doctorate programs funded through these actions are particularly important to me. In these programs, the researchers spent half their time in companies, from leading multinational companies to SMEs. Third, we have the University Business Forum. The Commission launched this initiative in 2008 to encourage higher education institutions and business to cooperate more closely with each other. The University Business Forum brings together representatives from the two sectors so they can share success stories, learn from each other, and, crucially, get ideas for new projects and curriculum design. 
as well as a biannual event here in Brussels. The next one is coming up in March 2017. We also organize forums in member states, normally together with ministries, rectors' conferences, employers' organizations, regional bodies, and others. A national event of this kind is taking place today in San Sebastian. Discussions at the forums have led to the creation of European knowledge alliances now integrated into the Erasmus Plus program. These are transnational partnerships between businesses and universities to create new cur curricula and other educational innovations. Finally, as you might know, we are currently reviewing the EU strategic policy for the higher education sector. This is an important part of implementing the education side of the skills agenda, which the Commission presented in June. I believe that we should focus on three overarching themes. First, supporting our universities and colleges to deliver more learning and teaching that is relevant to society and the economy. Second, maximizing the potential of our higher education institutions to become drivers of innovation and economic and social growth in our regions. Third, bringing teaching and research together in a more meaningful way to make them mutually reinforcing in the life of every student at whatever level. I count on you to get involved in this important initiative your expertise and ideas will help us ensure that we get it right. If we want to be able to develop, attract, and keep the best brains in the world, our education systems need to be fit for purpose, modern, flexible, and centered on the needs of our economies, our communities, and our young people. Ladies and gentlemen, we must innovate and exchange across borders and boundaries. But we should also remember that innovations emerge at local and regional levels before they are taken up globally. We all know that universities and industry need to work together. What we need to do now is to find more ways of extending and intensifying this cooperation. It needs to become a core business for both sectors. I'm confident that you will come up with ideas on how we get there in your discussions today, and I'm looking forward to hearing about them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Let's come back to a few of the to a few points that you uh, that you mentioned. Should we start by the role of universities? Throughout uh, all the research and studies, uh, universities always stand out as the core, at the core of, uh, of clusters in Europe. What is the Commission doing to help build an ecosystem around those leading universities in Europe? Oh, well, yes, I think uh, universities has a huge and very rich tradition in, in European culture. It's uh, basically um, invented in Europe, innovated all the time in Europe, and uh, now, even now, Europe is a front-runner in higher education systems. But on the other hand, we have to support universities to transform themselves from being the ivory towers of knowledge, purely theoretical knowledge, into a practical hub of skills, experiences, also theoretical knowledge, and regional economic growth. And that's why we would like to help them in this transformation process. We're just making our evaluation or preview of the higher education, European higher education strategy. And the first results suggest that there is a need coming from the higher education institutions, but also from business and also from governments and public administration to make uh, uh, universities and higher education institutions more useful in practical terms, to include them <coughs> into the generation of economic growth, 
uh, generating economic growth and helping local economic actors to, to be linked to universities, to capitalize the knowledge of the academia and uh, universities, and uh, bringing in universities into the economic life of the given region as well. And we help them via Erasmus+, Plus, uh, via uh, strategic papers, workshops and uh, university business uh, um, events and, and organizations. Very good. Can we, can we also touch upon the question of skills? Um, if you look at, uh, at the uh, EU policy agenda for education, uh, there was the, the new skills agenda for Europe that was adopted by the Commission in June, right? Yes. Uh, do you want to give us just uh, uh, just highlights of what's new uh, in this agenda? Uh, it's a very long agenda, but just give us a few points. Well, let me start that the agenda itself is very new. Uh, you know that uh, traditionally employability has been at the center of, uh, of the education policy at European level. But what does it mean? What is it? to be employable? Uh, does it mean uh, to be equipped with technical skills, narrow-minded, very specialized, uh, rigid skills, which you probably make you employable in a very narrow segment of the, of the labor market, but uh, absolutely useless in other segments of the labor market? Um, so. The approach of the new sk uh, skills agenda is, is, is absolutely new. We emphasize the importance of the so-called horizontal skills and uh, life skills or soft skills, entrepreneurial skills, social skills, um, per the role of personality, uh, experiences in, in other countries, in other cultures, which makes you more flexible, your personality, more uh, adaptive, more flexible. So the education part of the skills agenda uh, really concentrate on, on the so-called horizontal, social and soft skills. Soft skills are fundamental. But uh, today's conference is about digital skills, and I understand that digital skills can also be soft. But in fact, the Ubers and the Airbnbs are uh, funded by computer engineers. Do we have enough of those in Europe? hope so, but we need uh, a <laughs> favorable circumstance for that. Uh, and uh, we have to we have to transform our uh, environment, the investment environment, more favorable for, for private companies to invest in education and skills. And that's why we are looking for uh, those uh, meeting points and solutions, organizational solutions, which can be attractive to business as well. For instance, the European Institute for Innovation and Technology which developed the knowledge and innovation communities in ICT and in other areas as well, is a, is a good opportunity to bring together business and academia. And we have the uh, digital single market strategy, which also can open up some new opportunities for IT companies, for business people to invest in education of digital skills, and help uh, European education systems to be more digi digitized or more up to date. So this week is coding week, right? Yes. So what's the, what's the objective and what's the impact uh, of such an initiative? Do you think it's good enough to raise awareness of young people and of the importance of these digital skills? The objective is promoting uh, coding as again, as a horizontal skill, because it's not, it's not only making, and probably not primarily, making softwares, but uh, coding is uh, becoming a, contemporary li a, a kind of con contemporary literacy. And, uh, and European education systems are lagging behind in, in coding. 
So we would like to promote those skills and, uh, and support uh, those NGOs or education institutions who would like to, to introduce and promote uh, coding skills. And uh, you mentioned another uh, EU initiative that is the European Institute uh, for Innovation and Technologies. Uh, there was a report uh, from the European Court of Auditors uh, that highlighted severe weaknesses uh, in the in the implementation of the uh, and in the in, in the functioning of the EIT. What are you planning to do about that? Well, yes, uh, we've inherited uh, um, quite difficult situation in certain points. Uh, there was a, a difficult start for the European Innovation uh, Institute for Innovation and Technology. Now we are closing that, I hope that we close that difficult period of uh, the start. We, we uh, elaborated a new work program. We set up a new advisory, high-level advisory uh, group or board, and they help the EIT to, to open a new chapter of activities. We are launching new kicks. That is, um, that is um, an, uh, a new period of uh, expansion. And uh, with the new management, uh, we stabilize the, the financial and also the organizational and structural situation in EIT, so I'm pretty optimistic about the future. So you mentioned a new management. Is there a new management uh, soon to be put in place? Yeah, they are in place. There's just some acting management, but basically that's the germ of, uh, of, the, of the new management. Very good. I think, I'm sorry about that, but I think we need to uh, tackle the elephant in the room, uh, Brexit. Uh, UK universities are in a very dark place uh, at the moment. What can you tell them to reassure them? First, the procedure hasn't been triggered yet. So we don't know the details of negotiations. Uh, we don't know even the, the starting positions of the negotiating partners. Second, uh, for me, Brexit is about institutional links and issues, not about intellectual links and issues. I think there's no doubt that the United Kingdom and Britain has always been a part of the European culture and the European intellectual sphere. Uh, the question is how to make it manifest, how to institutionalize, how to keep together that European intellectual space and, and we are working on that and we will be working on that in the future with our British friends. But how can the EU have a cluster policy and a policy to interlink clusters with the UK out? Well, we have uh, various models of, uh, of working together uh, with non-member states. There is the Swiss the, the Norwegian model, we have the neighborhood policy solutions, we have, uh, we have very good examples in, in Erasmus Plus or in Creative Europe to include those countries, those actors who are, who are not working or living in, in EU member states. So we have to find a proper solution and we will find a proper solution, I'm sure. Thank you. I think we can, uh, we can stop on that positive note. I hope our UK friends are a bit reassured. <laughs> Mr. Commissioner, thank you very, thank much. You very much. Thank you. Well, it's time to uh, go into a more practical discussion and uh, to look at what's happening on the ground. How does a good cluster work? Uh, this is a broad question, and before we jump into uh, uh, a discussion with uh, speakers that I will introduce in a second, uh, I would like to, uh, to invite Vicky Ford uh, to come on stage and to introduce the topic. Uh, Vicky Ford is a member of the European Parliament, very active in the innovation debate. 
uh, you also uh, chair the committee uh, on uh, uh, internal markets and consumers. So Vicky, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, can you hear that? Thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this conference this morning. I was reminded as we walked through the park that this was where Einstein met Marie Curie um, 90 years ago exactly. And so what a great place to be talking about clusters and bringing scientists together. And um, I am absolutely convinced that we need to talk about Europe's te top tech clusters to see what works well, to learn from each other's experience, and better understand how we can help them all grow. And I am actually going to pick up exactly where the Commissioner left off and talk about the UK's tech clusters and the importance of them to the rest of Europe. The region that I represent in the east of England has many different clusters. On our coast, we have um, engineers who are pioneering next generation wave and wind and the next generation nuclear too. We have two of Europe's top agri-tech clusters. We have a whole biotech cluster around GlaxoSmithKline and outstanding aerospace and industrial research around Cranfield University. And smart specialization like that has many positives. But the argument that I want to bring to you today is that we also need to keep our multidisciplinary cluster. And in particular, at the heart of the region that I represent is Cambridge. Cambridge is Europe's fastest growing tech cluster. It is one that adds value to all of European science, and I'd like to explain why I believe it is in the interest of both the UK and the EU to keep those clusters successful and collaborating and cooperating with each other in a world post-Brexit. The Cambridge cluster started from the bottom up. It was led literally by a couple of entrepreneurial chemical engineers from the university back in the 1960s. In the first uh, two decades, 400 different enterprises were formed. They were all in ICT. But today, five decades on, we have over 4,000 different tech companies and many, many, many sectors, biotech, medtech, cleantech, agritech, fintech. They're all in the mix. We have twice as many startups per head as anywhere else in the UK. And the startups from Cambridge live longer than anywhere else. We're also a scale-up city. We have, over, uh, we have 15 different homegrown firms which have blown through that billion-dollar valuation. The tech unicorns, 15 are from Cambridge. That's two more than London. Um, of the 200,000 local jobs, over 20,000 are in biotech alone, one in 10. That's why AstraZeneca has just decided to move their headquarters to Cambridge. And this summer, the local firm Arm was sold for 24 billion pounds. That's the equivalent of nearly 200,000 pounds for every man, woman, and child in the city. Oh, that the money had been dispersed like that how we would wish. But anyway, what makes Cambridge successful is the combination of that outstanding research work from the university, indeed universities, with the entrepreneurial networks around it, networks of enterprise resources and goodwill. And also the city is a great place to live. Scientists like to live in great places, don't forget that. As a leading entrepreneur said to me, Cambridge's first thought is not how do I make it successful. Sorry, Cambridge's first thought is not how do I make money out of it, but how do I make it successful, putting the success before the money. Um, and many studies tell us that innovation is at its most dynamic where those two or more disciplines interface. And in Cambridge, this happens all the time. It's a multidisciplinary cluster 
where the different spheres of science collide and that generates those new and exciting solutions. I'll give you an example. The astronomy department have adapted their algorithms for watching the night sky to help the oncologists map out how different breast cancers grow. And this has led to real developments of new personalized treatments and improved cure rates for women with cancer, literally using stargazing to cure cancer. And in Cambridge, this is quite normal. It's not driven by money, it's driven by interest. I was joking to my team earlier, you know, sometimes in Cambridge, it doesn't just feel like we're watching the Big Bang Theory on TV, we're actually acting it out in our tap. Um, you know, many technology clusters are driven top down by politicians who want to say, how do I move from old-fashioned manufacturing or oil and gas or agriculture to a new knowledge-intensive uh, sector. And the, the politicians, and I see it all the time, were guilty of it in my region too, will set up science, uh, science parks and believe that just putting the buildings and the money will encourage the entrepreneurial behavior. But yes, those facilities and that infrastructure is important. You need to have those but it's the people that are much, much more important. And what we know from studying that 50 years of developing the Cambridge cluster is that the success is led by enterprising individuals working together. And we also know that when individuals collaborate between clusters, that drives innovation too. I look, for example, at the links between Heidelberg and Cambridge, uh, which keep Europe literally at the world front of bioinformatics um, and genetics research. And for many years, there have been more British scientists taking part in European collaborative framework research projects than from any other country. And, more, and under the Horizon 2020, more of those researchers are coming from the Cambridge cluster than any other British university cluster. And when I talk to those researchers about why do they fill out all those forms and go through all those bids to take part in those European re research collaborations, they remind me again and again that it is not just about the money. It's because when they take part in collaborative research, it makes it easier for them to share ideas and helps them to generate new solutions. And the evidence shows that where scientists collaborate together in their research, that research goes on to have greater impacts. There are many other links between Cambridge and Europe which are not, of course, EU-funded or outside Horizon, and are outside Horizon 2020 and aren't even government-run. There are now huge ties between the entrepreneurship organisations of Cambridge with the European Outback Forum and the summer schools they're running for future European entrepreneurs. Our angel investors are linked into networks of angel investors, both in France and in Denmark, and driving investments in these different countries too. I do believe that the Cambridge cluster, and indeed many, many of our UK clusters, add value to research all across Europe. And in a post-Brexit relationship, the number one priority that researchers and innovators have told me in and around the city is to keep a free and easy exchange of knowledge, skills and talent between the UK science clusters and the rest of the EU. A successful cluster, because this is about how does a good cluster work, a successful cluster is built around individuals. That's what we've learned from 50 years of building up the Cambridge cluster, and we know that if individuals cannot share their knowledge easily, they may disperse. It took 50 years to create this one cluster, and if those valuable networks of links disperse, they will not be easily rebuilt elsewhere. And some think that post-Brexit, we can just poach all the talent out of the UK and move it 
to other parts of the continent. But if the clusters of the UK are blocked out of the EU research networks, I don't believe that the talent will necessarily flow elsewhere in the EU. It risks being lost to Europe as a whole. Many of those active in my local cluster do have strong links to Europe, but they also have strong links to the US and China. And if we don't get the future collaboration wrong, it won't be a case of those individuals relocating to Germany or France or Sweden. The choice that many um, organizations, many businesses as well, tell me is a choice between being in Cambridge, England, or Cambridge, Massachusetts, Silicon Fen, or Silicon Valley. And Europe as a whole then will, I believe, lose out. I don't believe that is in the interests of science or of innovation. And I really do hope that all of you in this room who care so much about science and innovation and the value of cross-collaboration between clusters will fight to keep collaboration and cooperation going on between our scientists in the UK, the rest of the EU, and indeed across the world too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vicky, for setting the scene so nicely. Uh, we now be able to, uh, to go deeper in the topic, how does a good cluster work? And for that, I would like to invite, uh, to invite the speakers, uh, the members of the first panel on stage, please. Uh, and while you come up, I will introduce you. First one on stage is François Chota, uh, the head of uh, the Ile-de-France office here in Brussels, and you're a member of ERIN. You will tell us in a minute what ERIN is. Jaak Avisco is director of uh, Tallinn University of Technology. Detlef Eckert is a director uh, in charge of skills at DG Employment in the European Commission. Lambert van Nosterhoy is a member of the European Parliament. And Michael Hilking is a collaboration director in the UK R&D Centre at Huawei Technologies. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'd like to kick off with you, Mr. Van Nosterhoy. Just because uh, we heard from Vicky Ford uh, that Cambridge is doing so well in being a multidisciplinary cluster. Well, the EU isn't really going in that direction with the smart specialization strategies, right? I just could hear, listen to Vicky with her explanation, very good. Uh, on your question, I think there are two sides. Specialization in fundamental research keeps essential. <coughs> you know, you go deeper. And beyond that, within universities or even between parts of Europe or big cities, it's extremely important to find, let me say, cross-overs. And it can come from different sectors. So it is both specialization in Europe and now with their it's a precondition to get European funding from the regional funds that you specialize. We call it smart specialization. And it means that some parts of France, for instance, go strictly in the direction of aviation. Take Toulouse, 40,000 people working, a lot of research. There you find the Airbus, our big symbol throughout the world, a big success. So specialization brings the bridge to employment, not just fundamental research, because we did too often a lot of specialization in fundamental research, but the take up in take up in really economy was too low. So we bring together the possibilities for growth and jobs in regions. Their specialization can be on agriculture, on food, it can be on genetics, it can be on aviation, on cars and fundamental research and this combination is important for growth and jobs so this is smart specialization throughout europe throughout europe in the past when i came in the parliament in 2004 i learned that we had the world of the science seven research program horizon and the world of the funds of the regional funds 
these worlds are bring, brought together. It's a kind of a landing strip in regions for fundamental and applied science. So you have to specialize. Otherwise, in the worldwide competition, you won't come far. Thank you. Uh, Françoise, you are uh, the representative of a regional office here in Brussels. And uh, so you really uh, represent the regions here. Uh, you uh, were the chair of ERIN as well. Do you want to uh, explain what ERIN is to start with? Yes, thank you, Marilyn. I just want to refer to what Commissioner said about place-based innovation. Because as representative of regions and also within our network, European Regions Research and Innovation Network, we join more than 100 uh, Brussels offices here, but uh, with a lot of connection with the practitioners uh, in the home regions and the clusters, uh, the researchers, the university, because we are Brussels-based, but our daily work is also to help the players on the territory to be um, more in the European uh, dimension. Um, the ERIN network has been working on uh, four P's. First of, all, first of all, policy, because it's important to try to influence uh, the policy at the EU level. Uh, the second one is project, and I just want to uh, highlight um, what we call our brokerage events, uh, referring to what I've just said, uh, allowing uh, people of the Commission presenting programs and calls for project, but with also the practitioners of the region. And um, this is important to uh, help uh, clusters and actors on the territory to uh, develop and enhance their cooperation within Europe through EU funding. Partnerships is another element of our daily work in ERIN. Um, I just want to highlight one memorandum of understanding we have signed with France Cluster, uh, which allows them to develop their uh, European uh, uh, dynamic. And um, I just want also to say that uh, we, our last P is profile, and thank you for your, your invitation because, and thank you for Huawei to invite us because this um, today uh, intervention helps us to write the profile of the uh, of the regions. Just a very quick final word about what was said just before about the role of the of the regions. Uh, a lot of European regions consider, and politicians within these regions, consider that their role is to help the innovation ec ecosystem to, to be concrete. And um, with money, but also helping um, the, different, uh, um, the different ideas to, uh, to emerge. And I will give examples later on. So let's... Um, so this panel is really about finding the ingredients to make a, a cluster work. So let's narrow the, the geographical focus and look at Estonia and Tallinn in particular. Uh, we were speaking yesterday, you said that Estonia is a small country, but uh, Tallinn uh, University of Technology does have a key role in Tallinn region, in Tallinn region and uh, in Estonia probably. Do you want to tell us uh, about the role of the university, how you perceive it? Well, first of all, I'd say that Estonia is not a small country. <laughs> Belgium is a small country. Estonia <laughs> is a very small country. Um, very small. Um, listening to, to Vicky Ford, I once more recall that there is just one Cambridge in the world. There is only one Stanford and Silicon Valley. But there are more than 20,000 universities. And each of these has to contribute, and is contributing daily. Uh, what, is, what is the most important thing that makes a cluster work? Mm -hmm. I think it's people who want to make things happen with proper attitudes, entrepreneurial, uh, driven by curiosity, making things happen, willing to be successful, and I do believe that that is exactly what we see when we look at young students who, who want to make things happen. Second, and that's also, I think, a global phenomenon, but also very, very clear in Europe, 
that we see that clusters form where different components are there at the same time. Young people, big, small, and medium-sized industries, transport hub. If all these things match together, there is a potential for growth. And the most important driver that keeps these things going are young graduates of universities. They are the ones who make things happen. If you take this component out, the whole system falls apart. So I think the universities do have a very central role. And increasingly, increasingly we see that the, 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 the stories that some politicians keep still saying, we have ivory towers, it's long gone. It's long gone. Most universities understand very well what what's the future is about. And that's basically what has happened in Estonia. In addition to what I've said so far, there is one very important thing. Some 20, 25 years ago, when we get rid of the Soviet occupation, we simply wanted to catch up with all others. And we started from scratch, one way or the other, trying to catch up with the technically developed and very technology-oriented Finns and Swedes around, building with no banking, banks present. We started from scratch in 10, 15 years. These banks were the most innovative banks worldwide. That's at least what the Swedes said when they bought the Estonian banks. So very, very important is a proper attitude, the willingness to make things happen, and inspiring young people to work together. The young people, and so uh, that left, I think that leads me to the, uh, to the youth employment debate that is in full swing at the moment. Uh, do you want to, to give us the big picture uh, about the debate, about the youth employment debate? About <coughs> uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, well, uh, we, um, we were confronted um, since the crisis um, with a huge um, youth unemployment rate and also what is called needs, huh? so the young people not in employment, not in training, and not in education. So we started, uh, for started is maybe probably a wrong word, huh? so we were in a situation with about 7.5 million needs and 5.7 million unemployed young people, registered unemployed people, there's a difference in the statistics, so I don't want to go too much into the details, um, four years ago, uh, now, of course, the economy has recovered a little bit, so this has helped, but also uh, member states have taken actions and uh, we can say they have been guided by our youth guarantee policy, uh, coupled with uh, what is called a youth employment initiative, which uh, uh, links to uh, 6.4 billion uh, euro, which we uh, um, uh, give to the member states to support uh, uh, young people to find a job and education and so on and so forth. It had a difficult start because the so-called social, uh, European Social Fund is a bit of a bureaucracy um, and uh, hopefully in the next MFF we can solve this with the help of the parliament and uh, hopefully also with the consent of the, of the member state uh, in order to make the program a little bit uh, smoother and, uh, and, and more flexible. But nevertheless, we are now down to a little bit above 4 million young people unemployed. Uh, so this is a success. Not everything can be related to the EU youth guarantee policy, but we had certainly an impact um, that triggered down into, into the policy. And so young people um, uh, are still um, an issue for EU policy. And this is also why uh, the European Council in, sep in December will uh, we'll discuss uh, a new impetus to youth employment policy again. So it's too early to say what will come out of it, uh, but definitely there will be a package of new measures uh, to be discussed and hopefully decided in December. And looking specifically at uh, digital skills, uh, before we, uh, I ask you the question, when should we start uh, teaching these skills? Mm -hmm. uh, being a mother of two kids, mm -hmm. I'm very worried of seeing them with a screen at two and a half years old. Uh, but uh, Michael, uh, for a company like Huawei, um, I mean, first I should say that the shortage of IT skills in Europe is not a secret. So. Can you assess this shortage uh, in, uh, 
in your in your recruitment uh, effort uh, at Huawei Technologies, uh, do you see this shortage, or what what are you what, what are the main skills that you would be looking for? Thank you, Marilyn. This is a very broad question, and I think we need to step back a little piece and say, first of all, what are digital skills? And I'm going to break digital skills down into two very different camps. On the one hand, I'm going to say digital skills are ICT skills. In other words, how to use the ICT equipment for improving life and working better. The second is what I can call computer science skills which are far more technical, go much deeper, and are more for the specialists across society. And I would say that you need to start learning these skills young. Now, for people of the generation of many of us in the room, there was not the opportunity to learn digital skills young, and they've had to be learned later in life. That's okay. I should also say that in terms of people who Huawei recruits, I've been actively involved in recruiting um, people with PhDs from top world universities. And that's very, very different because here we are not looking at the people that Detlef refers to as the unemployed. We're looking at the very top of the, of the pyramid. And accessing this talent is a very different process and is very um, specialist and works on a global scale. When we start to move down the scale, we then need to think about who are the guys who are going to be using for example, the equipment that Huawei builds. Who is going to be installing the equipment? Who is going to be maintaining that equipment? And that is where there is a shortage of technical skills. And that's one of the reasons why Huawei has created a program, H-I-A-N-A, -A, which is actually working with technical colleges and some universities to give them materials uh, to create a program or supplement a program for teaching this kind of practical engineering skills that enable other people to um, use digital um, systems, equipment, and gives them a platform to build their own um, digital skills. And can you give us an example uh, just to, to make a transition with, uh, with university industry partnerships? In the UK, in the, in the UK R&D Centre uh, that's uh, uh, where you work, uh, can you give us examples of concrete cooperations with universities? Oh, many. Um, I work with more than 20 technical universities in the UK, which is a lot. And it's not just the UK where Huawei is active. We're active in very many places across Europe too. But practical examples, and there were some that um, Madame Chen put into her speech earlier. She mentioned our relationship with the um, University of Surrey and Professor Rahim is from Surrey here. She mentioned our relationship with Manchester. She mentioned our relationship with Cambridge. Um, and of course, Cambridge was celebrated very much by um, MEP Ford a few minutes ago. In fact, Cambridge is one of our top collaborators um, in the UK. So there are many examples and uh, it's very exciting to be involved in them. So the, um, we spoke about uh, about digital skills. Let's let's come back uh, for a second to the other types of skills that you mentioned, uh, Professor Avisco. And uh, um, proximity counts, right, in clusters. To have this proximity ongoing, what are the skills needed? Let's leave the digital side, uh, the, the digital skills aside for a second. How should we train the people to incentivize them to work with others? Well, first of all, I'd, I'd make a small comment concerning digital skills. I, I think we have to start very early, at the age of three to four to five. Algorithmic thinking. Young people are very, very talented in learning very complicated patterns at the age of four to five. University is far too late. If you miss this, these years from five to 10 to 15, then some of the people are so much afraid of, the, of engineering or the hard sciences that they will simply not be able to, to, to learn and adapt to that. But as for most important thing for clustering is cooperation. And our educational systems tend to be very individual. 80%, maybe 90% even, of what we learn in schools, we learn alone. 
And that's not a good idea, that's a very bad idea. We have to work in groups also starting very, very early. Better, younger than one year later. And cooperation and, and um, teamwork is something that we have to introduce to our national educational systems as early as possible. Again, university, it's already too late. 18-year-olds have already used to some bad habits, I would say. You used to be Minister of Education in Estonia. So what's the responsibility of the ministry uh, to put such a system in place? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a famous saying that uh, reforming a university is like removing a graveyard. There are no cooperation from inside and no understanding from outside. But changing an education, national education system is even worse. So it's very, very hard, but we have to start somewhere. Piloting, uh, looking for schools who are ready and willing to innovate, and the governments and the authorities must be flexible to accept these innovative ideas on all levels. Less regulation, more deregulation, local initiatives, different modes of operation. I would, I would very much encourage that, and I try to do that as a minister as well. Whether I succeeded or not is another question. <laughs> Lambert, you wanted to yeah, come. Just taking up the point of uh, where, where to start or how to, to stimulate each other. I want to start from the other side of the entrepreneurship. What I see in the cities like Berlin and London with the fintech, that it is not just the big companies. Uh, that rule the waves, but is especially having much more out of entrepreneurial spirit, starting early to have the possibility to combine in a dual system your learning and what happens in the real economy or in care or whatever sector. So and there I see that re Europe now is recovering. Europe is taking up in the incubators where you start with students and with, with early, early enterprises, and then later growing out in what we call incubators, uh, accelerators, where we attract money to help them. And this is a new European spirit, because in all worldwide figures, we are lying behind the spirit of Silicon Valley or of um, probably other parts of the world. So this is the, 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 the stairway to excellence goes not only putting things in the head, but putting things in the hand. And make them help be entrepreneurs. Make them make the new Huawei, uh, let me say, or Apple or whatever. So this is, and then you talk today about the clusters, tech clusters. This is extremely important, what I said about specialization. Not buoy being good in everything, being good in some specialization, in which companies look around the world and say, where do we go, to South Korea, or do we go to Eindhoven, where I come from, in the Netherlands, or to, or to a place in, in UK. So there are location factors in which entrepreneurship these days is as important than science. So this is something that, that has to be added, and Mrs. Biankowska, a commissioner, will come up with a startup initiative this year, and it might be combined with your study about the tech hubs and bringing these two worlds together. Wow. Wowie. <laughs> In another event we were, uh, in another science business event we were at last week, a former MEP said, we, what we need is a Silicon Valley and a Francisco Bay in Europe. Yeah, but let me say this, I protest. <laughs> because we have so many. This is not looking to the Silicon Valley is, is a unique, but the tech clusters we see later in the study, they give opportunities to make a European scale on the European scale, those many stars, Funkel, Sparkle, European stars, these are the universities, the high schools, the other ones, together with entrepreneurs in, in their specialization. So I want to see, let me say, 150 at least in, 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 in Europe. So this is a different. Don't copy. But aren't we fragmenting the no, human capital? No, because what is, what is the fact? The fact is that Europe in its population the next 40 years, two people to pension, one youngster back. If we take all those to the big centers, the rural areas will depopulate. It's already so. This is not the Europe I want. Then you get that all the youngsters from Eastern Europe go to London or to Amsterdam. That is not the Europe we want. So, 
This week, this very week, there is an agreement on the bio-based science in Poland with 10 regions, with all the fundamental science, farmers, with the industry, to make Europe, uh, make Poland flourish on that point. See, this is the way of thinking, not centralizing the best of the best of the best. That can be, uh, that, that, that limits our uh, potential in Europe. Look to the people, it's a battle for talent, and don't concentrate the talent. Stimulate the, the talent. And, and anyway, nobody planned uh, Silicon Valley. It happened. So th things like innovation have just happened. Uh, you cannot plan it. I mean, you can provide a fertile ground in many areas, but then something happens, and it is a reflection of the culture, reflection of the situation, and a lot of luck sometimes. Huh? So if you have the right uh, innovator at the right place, uh, you may make a difference, or she makes a difference. So I, I don't think it can be planned. But you can, of course, do some kind of policy which uh, gives uh, everyone a chance to participate. And then you have this, uh, what our colleague just said, uh, namely uh, um, a variety of, uh, of approaches. Some successful, some not successful. Um, give you one example from uh, IT industry. Uh, uh, the, um, after unification of Germany, uh, Dresden was trying, with the active help of, um, of uh, the government, to develop an IT cluster. This was, let's say, half successful. Mm? So they wanted to create something which actually was much bigger than it actually emerged. One of the reasons is because the microelectronics they were focusing on, the market completely changed. That you cannot plan. But I'd still make one remark. When we when I think about top 10 Estonian startups in the last 10 years, only two of them are with their headquarters still in Estonia. Mm -hmm. Eight have left. Mm -hmm. Five of them to America, two to London, one to Berlin. Why is that happening? We have a problem. We have a problem and we have to address that. So I don't believe we can simply say that small is beautiful and let flowers flourish everywhere. This is not a solution. We may think it's a good value, but we have to be understand where the barriers are and what is not helping us. The fragmentation of markets, access to capital, uh, different legal systems that uh, prohibit faster growth of services, for instance, a number of obstacles. We still have too many of them in Europe, and I think we have to address that fairly. It's hard to say too many, because it's the battle, it's the, the fact that, they, that, that people in Romania and Bulgaria, even uh, talking, for instance, about energy, new energy way of, of, of bringing, can give prosperity, can give jobs. So in terms of, it's one side of the coin is concentrating, is excellence, excellence, we need it. But the other way in the take up, you need it diversity. So it's both of them. And what Europe does now in our banking initiatives, in the, the Capital Union, is getting more uh, risk capital coming in. The Juncker plan does the same for small, medium-sized companies, but also for, for bigger projects <coughs> to, to make it fly. So Europe should not be a Europe that limits possibilities of many parts of Europe and concentrates everything in, in capitals. This is not the way we want to look. So the debate has to be done. And especially your minister, you was a minister, in the council, bring this debate. So it's not theory, it's, it's, it's how you can develop Europe in this worldwide competition with a lack of talent, lack of people in the future. And then, yeah, you, what you do, you, you, you took Warsaw because a lot of people were there mm -hmm. to, to build your, your science well, like that. So you go where the people are, and this is, I think, important. And I think I should come in at that point and say, actually, it's very, one of the, if I was looking last night at some of the characteristics of what makes a cluster, uh, and something that um, Jak was saying earlier was something that's, I kind of guess, the fourth one on my list. So I'll, I'll run through and say, one of the biggest things about a cluster is that there is a group which has got critical mass in the same area of specialization. 
Another is, and this is something which um, Lambert was referring to, that they have a backup, they have an ecosystem, they have professional services which are behind them, and that includes access to capital. And the question there becomes, at what level do they have access to capital? Is it C capital, is it A round, is it B round, does it follow in even further than that? But the, the fourth area, which I think is important, and this is what Yak was, was alluding to, is to say, but a real cluster has the ability to attract companies and skilled people from outside of its own geographical reason. It acts as a magnet for a particular specialization. And this is something that, from a political point of view, is very difficult to try and control. And maybe the right thing to do is to make sure that the garden is weeded um, and, and nothing more. Um, so in terms of the developing a cluster, building a cluster, yes, it's where the small firms come in, but it's also where big firms like us decide to um, locate. And in the UK, we have um, three locations for R&D centers at the moment. Every single one of them is based where it is because of the skills available in the locality. I ha if, I make, if I could make a comment, I mean, just by, by listening and just uh, in my mind comparing some of the clusters, isn't it, I mean, it's more a question, huh? maybe some people could confirm or contradict, um, isn't one of the common um, denominator or what the common feature of those clusters that they attract people from all over the world? So that what, when you look at Silicon Valley, when you look at the founder uh, and the CEO currently of uh, uh, NVIDIA, for instance, one of the great companies in the computer sector, um, he is Chinese origin. Yeah? Um, uh, when you look at Berlin, for instance, I, I, I hope I do not uh, offend anyone in Berlin, but I would argue that um, the result of the, of the emerging cluster is not the result of wise, forward-looking public policy. Mm -hmm. It just happened mm -hmm. that Berlin is a very cool city for many people, and that you meet people from all over the world. And the living costs are reasonable, so young people flock to the city, and they create something, basically grassroots. So it's happening because there, there, there are some p uh, possibilities there. But in the end so of the day... So you're saying that as part of the, of the ingredient that makes the cluster work, uh, the environment and it the, it's the, the environment. of a city. Yeah, b b b uh, I, I don't know who said it, but researchers would like to live and enjoy life and they have a high standard even, so you need some sort of cultural um, uh, support. So I think one of the real c um, uh, uh, features of those clusters is international, which actually is quite ironic when you look at the current nationalistic discussion all over the world, yeah. no, not only in Europe, about closing borders instead of just doing the opposite, namely being multicultural as an ingredient for innovation. Maybe I would like to, to highlight one or two uh, examples uh, and uh, about inspiring new people. Uh, I have uh, uh, one example about uh, the creation of a master on cluster management between the Kiel University in Germany and Strasbourg University. And I think it's uh, something which could be of interest because uh, it has been funded by the EU through Interreg A uh, uh, funding. And I think it's interesting to, to see that uh, uh, the, the, stud the study program of the master is based on elements we have already pointed out. Uh, economy, uh, in economic intelligence, but also the interculturality uh, uh, way of working, uh, cooperation and entrepreneurial uh, spirit at ICT. This, I think, is a good example to, uh, uh, to highlight uh, the way uh, university and industry can work together because these um, managers cluster managers, they, uh, they are also in capacity in uh, being in apprenticeship during their master in the cluster or different uh, uh, structure. And in Ile-de-France also, there is a new uh, uh, master, or we call it, uh, it has been created by uh, a research poll, Sorbonne and Arrêt Métier, uh, with the idea to, uh, uh, to put 10 university and high school together, uh, and they create a sort of uh, semester 
which is uh, dedicated to, st to students, uh, allows them on a multidisciplinary uh, uh, level to work within a project. So they are really involved in um, uh, identifying uh, solutions, innovations, linking with the, uh, the cluster and the SMEs. So here there are two examples of partnerships of, uh, I mean, of universities. Uh, are, are there any, any connections with multinationals and with the industry? Uh, yes, sometimes also, for example, our Paris region enterprise uh, is organizing what we call tech meetings, allowing large companies, SMEs, but also the, the research uh, uh, part to work together. And when they uh, invite people on uh, one uh, in one sector activity, they already take uh, uh, SMEs or cluster coming from outside Europe, from Europe and outside Europe. So this, this is also uh, sought uh, with the international dimension at the beginning. So I hear the um, international dimension of the clusters, I hear the importance of talents, uh, I hear the importance of connections. Uh, Michael, can I come to you in terms of uh, teaching and, and training the talents, the best of the best of the best, as you said, what's the responsibility of multinationals? You need those talents. So in the training process, what's the, the industry responsibility? Wow. Um, that's a big question because suddenly we are linking the multinationals with the individuals. Um, and what is the responsibility? I'm going to go back and say, actually, probably the responsibility for the talent development lies with the individuals themselves and does not rely with the, with the university and does not rely with the school and does not rely on the, um, the company. We have to create our own um, connections and create our own skill base by being involved in the right places at the right time is how we do it. So what is the responsibility of the multinationals? We do hire graduates, we do hire new PhDs, and we want them to get more skills, so we offer them training um, when they come on board. But of course we want a very high level um, before we start. Yes, please. Um, I think if we look at successful clusters where universities are also involved, we see a very clear pattern that those academic institutions are clearly much more multinational than the average institutions. Europe-wide, I think, foreign students account for 3 to 5% of the student body. Academic staff, the same number, less than 10%. But in, in strong developing clusters, this is more 20%, 30%, even 50% of foreign academic staff and students. So I think this is, this is one very important component. And in addition to that, I think we shouldn't forget about local governments and uh, central government as well. They can create the environments, attitudes, making it easy to move people here and there, create suitable, suitable frameworks of cooperation, sometimes supporting financially, but even more importantly, by creating a, a framework, a legal legal and um, I would say cultural framework that is accepting, that is encouraging people to move in that direction. Multicultural, uh, multicultural values, uh, all this stuff is very, very important. So it's very, very hard if the, if the community around you, local government first and foremost, is not creating a favorable atmosphere, it's very, very hard to develop for a successful classroom. At this stage, maybe uh, someone in the audience would like, to, would like to ask a question. Do we have questions in the audience? Yes, please. Sorry. Julien Blanc, I represent the University of Aix-Marseille here in Brussels. A very simple uh, question. What about uh, venture capitalism and the business angels for the success of clusters? Can just to hear the panel on that subject. So is venture capital a key ingredient to make a cluster work? Who would like to take the question? Well, it, it's one of the long-standing discussion whether or not we have enough um, venture capital in Europe. I, I don't have now the, the latest figures or the latest analysis, so this is uh, something which will also figure prominently in the startup initiative 
uh, which the uh, uh, Commissioner Bianchowski, under the leadership of Bianchowski, will, will come out. Um, there's also uh, uh, and good attempts of governments and also by the European Commission and uh, to add a kind of fund of funds, huh? so to, in order to stimulate the venture capital, um, has been uh, successful to some extent, but there's always the feeling it's too little, so there should be, should be done more. There's also uh, venture capital alone, you, uh, normally people say venture capital alone will not make it, you, you, you really need to link it to business angels and to a kind of ecosystem which um, allows the, um, uh, the venture capitalists to take more risks. And this is one of the problems. So I, uh, in general, people say that we have in Europe sufficient uh, enough uh, venture capital to start small companies to a certain extent. But when it happens that you want to grow and to become very aggressive in the market, then the venture capital or the, the financing is a problem in Europe. So financing for growth is the real problem, not really financing for startups. And here, obviously, in the US, there seems to be a much better climate and infrastructure to finance growth. You see this in companies where the investors bear for 10 years no profits, only losses. In, in Europe, it's really hard to get it. Although there are examples where five, six, seven years of uh, loss making is also digested by, by, by investors. But in the US, it, it is a different level. And uh, I spoke once, a couple of years ago, to some companies in Europe, and they told me that uh, when they really want to go for the 20 million, 30 million venture capital, they go to Silicon Valley and present their, their project over there because here the, the, the difficulties to get really growth funding is too high. So this seems to be, I think this should be addressed, um, venture capital for growth. I think that could be the, time, the topic of an entire discussion. Uh, Lambert first and then Francois. Yeah, just shortly, venture capital is one side, the answer has been given. The other side in Europe is that we, uh, Europe is prepared. Now the banking system has hardly gone. If there is no profit in two years, banking system is, is, is nowhere. So what we did is that we brought these this guarantees. It means that if you have to develop three or four or five years, because if you go into the new networking or in the economics or whatever, if you don't get time, you can fly. You know, you need, need seven, eight, sometimes ten years to be, to be through this development. And there the, the EIB, European Investment Bank, cost, got 315 uh, billion now to spend uh, to give guarantees. And at that moment you go to private capital and say for that high risk part, it can go back bankrupt, for that high risk part of the investment. And then you see ba sometimes banking or private or venture coming in flying in. And this is really important because the reluctance in Europe, if you compare it with the United States, for instance, it's very big, but coming in with an instrument of guarantees, it can help regions to develop, ecosystems to grow, and to invest on the longer scale. The energy transition needs to earn back. What you invest now, you need eight years, then you have it back. If someone takes the risk to for the big new investment in new technology, okay, it will fly. So this is something else than just venture capital. Just yes, to react to, to the question between startup and scale-up, uh, I think that uh, uh, what I mentioned just before about this tech meeting organized by Paris Region Enterprise, uh, uh, they told me that uh, um, in order to help the growth of the startup, uh, the meetings they are organizing in this international dimension allows also startup to work together because they are not in competition between them, they are complementary, and it helps uh, them to grow. So I think it's interesting to see that at the beginning, the idea was to uh, link large companies and startup, but at the end, there are also cooperation which are enhanced between uh, startups in order to develop their growth. I think there was another question in the room. 
Thank you. Uh, good morning. And I'm Vincenzo Giovasi from the University of Pisa in Italy. And uh, we are lucky to have many of the ingredients that the MEP Ford mentioned because, you know, it's a pleasant place to live, a young population. We have some 60,000 students in a city of 80,000, so just figure. Mm -hmm. uh, 5,000 researchers in different three universities. So it's, and we do have clusters with lots of small enterprises. And uh, many of them overcome those difficulties, like uh, getting venture capital. I have a startup in next door uh, who had quartered in London, got uh, venture capital from the US, and they are trading. All the talent is local, so all, all people come in there. And the, their greatest difficulty comes not from the reality of business, but from institutional barriers. And this, there is this strong sensation that local government, city and regional level, understands these things about clusters and innovation. And the EU, EU, at the European level, certainly they understand this innovation, while the national government has a more of an, you know, uh, we are going to regulate all business in the same way, and this works for established business and works very badly for startups and uh, you know, innovative companies. So uh, I would like to know what are your experiences with trying to pierce that institutional barrier to growth? It's a long, it's a, it's a long um, uh, experience, because it's not experience from now, but it's experience over years. First, second is you are positive. And I could visit several of your um, clusters uh, you, your activities in the coding week, for instance. In fact, you are working on the talent. You do it. So it's not just having a debate here in Brussels in this wonderful Savoy uh, li library. Uh, do we lose or do we win? No. Do you we think the coding week actually we are has full a on track? So in terms of, but the question is, the member states. You know, the multi-level governance in which we bring the member states together with European programs. The council, you have the council, the ministers, and you have the parliament and European Commission making the proposals. So we are making this type of debates. For instance, regional funds are one third of European budget of your, your taxpayers' money. Goes back to the regions and to development. We say that if you don't come with specialization, if you don't come with seven years agreements to invest in this talent here and this talent there, you don't get that money. So in terms of it is a conditionality that we introduced 2014, 2020, before money flows. In the past, Sicily got an envelope and every time five billion in it for Sicily. After five years or seven years, same situation, same GDP, nothing happened. So we don't do that anymore. You say what you can offer for your people, what you can offer for prosperity in the country, and making Europe stronger. This is multi-level governance by which the member states are part of the deal. And regions, hmm. member states, and regional authority. The, the, left. the reason why this is a valid but also very complicated question to answer is because you refer to policies which at first glance have nothing to do with clusters and innovation. Now it's the general policy how the countries, uh, let's say, organize the uh, labor market law, um, tax regulation and, and everything else. And this has implication for clusters that would like to move, or for young people or for entrepreneurs that would like to start fast, quickly and have no time to do to th think about regulation and all kind of things. And also when you look at the digital environment, a, l a lot of our, let's say, uh, inherited regulation for the pre-internet time is no longer really fit for purpose. And it's really a difficulty to adjust it. But the problem is you really have to dig deep into one particular issue and then to solve it. But the problem is they are very often lots of interest at stake that prevents you from changing something because the new things is just happening whilst the old establishment is still there. And it, I don't want to pick now examples um, because it would go too much into detail. And this is the problem because you really have to go into the detail. And um, we are trying to, let's say, through the so-called European semester to um, invite member states uh, to carry out structural reforms. 
And basically this is part of the agenda and it should trickle then into some sort of better innovation. Yes, yeah. I wanted to also to make a small remark. I think it's very interesting to look how different areas in UK voted concerning Brexit. <laughs> the clusters voted one way and non-clusters the other way. I believe that it's, for Europe, it's a much better future if we think about it as a, as a conglomerate of, of cities or centers of development rather than nation states in <laughs> the long run. Whether we are ready for that today is another question. I'm r rather skeptical no. about it. There is no. closing no. down rather than opening up. But let's hope still. And I think there's, there's where the clusters of development on the global scale can contribute on the political level for the prosperous Europe as well, beyond economic or academic success. So is that right to say that uh, the clusters understand better the need to be interconnected with the rest of the world? Very good. Uh, I think it's time to break for coffee. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll come back here at, uh, at 11, okay? Uh, please come back here about uh, oh, well 5 to, 11. Uh, to 11. 11. I'd like 11. to thank you very much uh, for this interesting discussion. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Very good. Very good. Uh, yeah, I could visit.
Come back to your seats. We will start in, uh, in one minute. Uh, I need a little click up thing. Um, he said he was going to give me one, actually. No, I'm going to. Oh, he's coming. Can I sort here somewhere? Or how okay. I'm good, yeah. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, <laughs> so now is the time to speak about this report that you all have in your packs. Uh, this report entitled uh, 10 Tech Hubs, uh, Europe Wireless Clusters That Make Industry and Jobs Grow. And uh, no one would speak better about it than the, the editor of the report. Uh, so uh, I'd like to introduce uh, David Pringle, uh, who indeed acted as, uh, as editor uh, for, this, uh, for this report. Uh, David is going to take, you to take us uh, through uh, a quick presentation on what was the, uh, the idea behind uh, this, this report. And then I think we'll follow up with a discussion with some of the clusters that, uh, that we covered. David, over to you. Excellent. Thanks, Marilyn. So, uh, yeah, as Marilyn said, I'm David Pringle. Um, I'm the editor of this report. Uh, I'm the one to blame if, you're, uh, if your cluster isn't in there. I want to give you a little bit of thinking behind the report and how we chose the clusters, because this is very much not a ranking at all. It's not a top 10. The internet is full of uh, top 10 lists of this, that, and the other. This is not a top 10. We chose these rankings really to give a cross-section of different types of clusters, different kinds of clusters. And we're looking in particular at how digital technologies are embedded in long-standing industries. So we're looking at how industry as a whole, how the economy's changing, rather than Angry Birds or Pokemon Go or you know, even Spotify or Skype, which are you know, very impressive platforms and do a lot of good stuff. And a lot of people get a lot of enjoyment out of them. But this is more about changing the fabric of the economy itself. Uh, it's about the digitization of Europe, essentially. So these, these clusters are just a representative cross-section of those clusters and how they're changing industry. So, you know, Paris could have been in there, Helsinki could have been in there, many others could have been in there. There's a lot of worthy candidates. So this is not a top 10. I really want to stress that. Um, yeah, we, um, we've looked in particular at how Industries are harnessing digital technologies both internally to improve their, their internal efficiency, et cetera, but also externally how they deal with customers and other stakeholders, et cetera, because that's really what's changing in the world now is that digital technologies is making it much easier to interact, much more automated, much more um, uh, sort of embedded in everyday life, essentially. It's not just about looking at your email. Uh, now, in each profile, we've put in five scores on areas of policy. Uh, these will be a little bit controversial, and uh, you know, this is not, a, not an academic paper. It's more about uh, stimulating a conversation. Those five scores are around investment in education, public support for research, availability of public seed funding, uh, favorable taxation, whatever that may be. That's a, 
that's a big topic in itself, and integration into the EU R&D framework. And we, we've used some um, you know, good sources for that, but we've also used some subjective judgments. So those scores, again, are like starting a conversation. And we've also put a bunch of stats in the, uh, in the report. And what's interesting about the stats is often some of these clusters score quite low. They don't actually have a particularly high R&D spend, or they don't necessarily have a great deal of venture capital, or they don't have a lot of companies in the Forbes Global 2000. They don't necessarily have that industrial base. And that's kind of what's interesting is that in many cases, these clusters have thrived in spite of missing what might be seen as a key ingredient. So again, if you look at those statistics, they're not just about highlighting the good things. Sometimes they're about saying, actually, this cluster's quite weak in this area, but it's quite successful anyway. Uh, we've also put in some snapshots of key local players. Obviously, again, there's a lot of local players that aren't in there. We just kind of picked out ones we thought were interesting. Uh, and we've also put in the thoughts of a, a local visionary, somebody who knows the cluster really well or knows a particular technology or, or theme and gives us an insight into where the cluster's going. So uh, here are the themes uh, mapped out uh, nicely on this map. You can see uh, you know, we've chosen a, a particular topic around each cluster. Copenhagen, for example, renewable energy, Rotterdam, logistics. Uh, in London, we focus very particularly on wireless technologies and uh, London's kind of um, work with both Guildford and Cambridge around wireless. Uh, Dublin, very much a, uh, you know, a, a second home for home for big US internet companies. Berlin's got its uh, you know, very formidable internet-based uh, ecosystem, lots of interesting apps and services coming out of there. Stockholm, we're looking at uh, healthcare in particular. Uh, in Estonia, it's Dutch digital government. Munich, industry 4.0. Uh, in the Côte d'Azur, that's very much about a uh, cross-fertilization of different uh, science-led industries. There's a lot of interesting um, different um, uh, uh, high-tech clusters in the Côte d'Azur. It's not just an ICT uh, cluster. It's actually a, a cross-fertilization of ideas. And Barcelona, we're looking particularly at Barcelona's efforts around smart cities and uh, how it's ha harnessing wireless technologies to do that. So, as I say, there's a theme around each of those clusters. Now, I'm gonna, just going to highlight, I think it's four or five of these clusters. I'm not going to go through them all because some of them are are covered by some of the other panelists, but I'll give you a flavor of uh, the kind of things that we learned. So this is Copenhagen, obviously. Now, one th interesting thing in Copenhagen and the lesson for policymakers, I think, is around the clarity of the political vision in Copenhagen. And they, they've got some very aggressive targets around clean energy, and that's created a lot of certainty and uh, clarity for um, the private investors, for the private sector, for entrepreneurs, etc. And there's also a very strong willingness in Copenhagen to work with the private sector, to make data available, to make public uh, spaces available, to test new technologies, etc. So, uh, you know, Copenhagen has, has got this kind of long-term vision around uh, clean energy, and it's really pursuing it hard. And, you know, they've got some impressive uh, figures around... Uh, you know, how uh, strong that, uh, that sector is. Now, let's uh, move on to uh, the Côte d'Azur. Now, the Côte d'Azur is an interesting approach because it, it is actually a top-down initiative, really, by the French government dating from the 1960s around creating a science park and creating a cluster of clusters. And uh, it's a really long-term sustained effort by the French government. They've, they've got various incentives around, tax incentives around R&D, et cetera. And you know, it has had some uh, notable results. We've got some uh, important R&D centers from different industries in the, uh, in the Côte d'Azur. And you know, there's aerospace and there's uh, perfume, um, there's uh, optics and um, uh, computer-aided design, et cetera. A lot of interesting uh, R&D centers down there. I mean, one thing that the Côte d'Azur hasn't quite managed yet is actually to really harness that cross-sector fertilization and really make it happen. Some of the uh, uh, local studies on that say that this, these R&D centers are, are still not working together in the way that they might. But uh, it is obviously a success story, and it has enjoyed long-term sustained support from the French government. And that's you know a good example of long-term thinking there. Now let's uh, move on to Munich. Uh, <laughs> You've, you can see the theme very clearly here, education, education, education. In, uh, industry 4.0, I mean, uh, uh, Germany does lead the world in, in manufacturing in many respects. Uh, it's not resting on its laurels. It's looking at how it can use digital technologies to improve manufacturing and actually in create intelligent smart factories, intelligent smart uh, supply chains, etc. But the key thing that really comes out in Munich is the role of 
uh, the, the local universities and how they actually really do partner with the big industrial players in that area. And there's a real kind of uh, sense that they're in it together and it's not that the academics are doing one thing and the companies are doing another. There is a genuine partnership between the two. And um, the German education system is, uh, it more generally, is very strong. I think they announced last week they're going to put another 5 billion euros into equipping classrooms with um, more digital technologies, etc. So although Munich uh, and Germany as a whole has been very successful in manufacturing, it sees the need to uh, disrupt itself and move to uh, the next stage with digital technologies. And the Industry 4.0 initiative, you know, and the, the whole sense that uh, there's another level to move to is very, is, you know, very clear, coherent strategy for Germany. And uh, Munich's very much at the heart of that. Now, let me move on to uh, Stockholm. And I think this was a bit of a theme of the discussion earlier, but this is, Stockholm's a great example of um, a, a place that actually really welcomes uh, international multicultural talent. Uh, got a figure there around 2,500 Indian software programmers applying for visas to work in Stockholm every year. So uh, like Silicon Valley, it's kind of looking to harvest the best of the best talent from around the world. And, uh, you know, Sweden is one of those countries where there's a lot of factors at play. It's, an, you know, it's a very advanced economy. It's got a good education system, et cetera, et cetera. But I really wanted to highlight the, the role of this openness. Uh, and it's got a very strong digital technology industry, and it's now putting, applying that in healthcare and creating a very strong digital healthcare hub. And healthcare is notoriously hard to do. And uh, it really does take a lot of different ideas and a, a lot of different thoughts and a lot of different concepts to make health to improve healthcare. So, and Stockholm, you know, is at the our research shows that Stockholm is at the heart of that and is, is really moving it forward. So it's, it's taking a set of digital technologies and applying it very well in the healthcare space. Again, as I say, openness to new ideas and new people really leapt out of us uh, about Stockholm. Now let me just move on to Rotterdam. Now Rotterdam's, uh, you know, you wouldn't necessarily say Rotterdam tech cluster. You wouldn't think, wow, Rotterdam, digital technologies, etc. But Rotterdam's got a very advanced port. It's got a very advanced infrastructure. It, it's one, the, probably the leading port in Europe. But it's, it's uh, faces competition from Hamburg. It's, uh, it's under pressure to adopt the Internet of Things, to adopt digital technologies to improve its system. Again, it, it can't rest on its laurels. And actually here, the Dutch government is taking quite an uh, active role in this. It's kind of saying, come and use our public infrastructure, use our roads, use our waterways, use our ports, etc., to test new concepts. Um, and if you haven't seen the, or read about the European Truck Platooning Challenge, you should look at that, because that, that's a very interesting example of the Dutch government took an active role in leading that. It's these fleets of self-driving trucks coming all over, from all over Europe, heading towards Rotterdam. And that wasn't just about testing the, um, the underlying technology, that was also sending a message to Europe saying, we're going to need a consistent framework for autonomous vehicles or uh, self-driving cars, etc., because they're going to cross borders. We've got a whole international logistics industry here. Let's start thinking about that now. The Dutch government put this challenge together and is now actively lobbying at a European level for a consistent uh, pan-European policy. So, Dutch government uh, taking the lead, not allowing its own um, logistics industry, impressive though it is, to rest on its laurels. And we've got other examples of you know, where they're exploring even more uh, cutting-edge research the, uh, involved uh, in Elon Musk's uh, Hyperloop concept, which uh, some people are very skeptical about, but uh, you know, if, you don't, if you don't try it, you will never know. Uh, and that's about uh, traveling at the speed of sound between different cities. And uh, the Delft University of Technologies uh, came second in a competition around that. So Rotterdam, you know, may not leap out at you as a tech hub, but actually underneath the surface, underneath the skin, uh, it's doing a lot. It's using digital technologies to improve uh, long-standing, old-fashioned industry logistics. So um, I'm now going to move on to the panel discussion. We'll bring out some more uh, of the uh, success factors uh, in the various clusters during this panel discussion. Some of the ones that I haven't covered we'll touch on as, as well uh, here. So if I could invite the, uh, the panel to the stage, I'll inter uh, introduce them as they come up. We've got Christina Grove. She's head of uh, telemedicine development and healthcare at the Distance Innovation Center at the Karolinska University Hospital. Christina, uh, welcome to the stage. Uh, Jan Kratzer, he's uh, chair of entrepreneurship and innovation management and co-director of the Center for Entrepreneurship at the Technical University of Berlin. Jan, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I've uh, got Josep Luis Lariba Pei. He's Data Management uh, Director at the Polytechnic University of Catalonia. 
and the founder and CEO of Sparsity Technologies. Joseph, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you. And finally, uh, Christopher Keeley. Uh, he's uh, Senior Business Development Manager, Trinity Research and Innovation at Trinity College in Dublin. So you'll see that we've got, uh, we've got four of the, uh, the clusters uh, represented here. I'm just going to flick to my next slide. Now, uh, we're not going to go through this, but I'm just really pulling out some of the things that we discussed in the report there. And I may get the panel to react to some of those points. But you, don't have, you can ignore that slide if you want to. I'm, I'm going to start by asking you what you see as the main success factors in your particular cluster. So, uh, you're sitting next to me. I'll start with you. What's made Barcelona a successful cluster? I think that there are quite a few factors. Uh, one is talent. Uh, there is a lot of talent in, uh, in the area of uh, Catalonia. Um, there's also the fact that Barcelona is a very attractive city. Um, when people go there, they fall in, uh, fall in love with the city. And, and also, these two combined with the fact that there is a lot of entrepreneur entrepreneurship uh, talent as well. Um, this creates a very interesting combination that uh, attracts and, and has allowed us to grow this uh, yeah. cluster, right? Okay, it's interesting you're not highlighting the public policy side of things, but we'll come back to that. Okay. Uh, Christina, what's, uh, what's made Stockholm successful? Uh, I'm sure you can build on uh, what I said there. Yeah, uh, things that I find very important is that when we talk about innovation, because that uh, is what I think the clusters wants to provide, is that it's not an innovation until it's implemented. And it's not just about the technology, it's about using technology. So it's about changing work practices. This is what's making it so difficult to work with healthcare. And it cannot be done uh, without focusing, uh, with, without a specific focus from healthcare in this specific case. If you don't have the driving forces within healthcare, it would be very, very difficult to get it implemented in the end. So I think it's a successful cluster should involve healthcare much more. Healthcare must be in the driving seat to make the changes happen. That's what I think is important. Right, so it happens inside the healthcare industry rather than on the edges? Uh, it happens within the hospitals, within the healthcare communities, and we should do it together with uh, industry and academia, because there the good ideas are out there and also inside the hospital, but we need to innovate together. Okay, all right, we'll come back to that. Uh, Christopher, what's, uh, what's Dublin's success story about? Well, it's not leprechauns or the weather, unfortunately. <laughs> but what it is really is the network. I mean, I forget the digital network, that's interesting. It's the network of people in Dublin, the companies, the government, the state agencies, they all work together to make Dublin a very, very open and friendly environment to do business in and we give access to our um, educational system. We provide companies with, with leverage and funding, provide them with really highly talented individuals, and we make them feel welcome. And again, it's a network, it's amazing. In Dublin, you can actually come in Wednesday, you can meet the IDA, EI, and the colleges, and meet the minister by next Thursday. Right. So it's, it, it's really open. <laughs> open door policy there. Okay, Jan, Berlin. Um, <clears throat> the first point I would say is a high concentration of science. I mean, um, Berlin and surroundings, uh, we speak about six universities, um, 20, 30 applied universities, Helmholtz, Fraunhofer institutions. Um, and a high, a high density of science also applies to a high density of young researchers, uh, and that's the human material you need for startups. Let, let's build on that, actually, because one of the things that came out in the report was, okay, education is massively important, but it's not just education in science, it's education in in management, entrepreneurial skills, etc. So in other words, so some of the skills that you see in Silicon Valley and maybe you see less of in Europe. Does anybody feel that Europe's not doing enough of that? Or you know, would you like to see more management uh, expertise here? I think it's really important because I think we, can, we can't stand still in our laurels. I think for us, innovation is continually moving. and We have to react and also essentially um, predict where we're going to be in five, ten years' time. So Trinity, for example, is opening a new business school. We're going to put a second campus right in the centre of the Silicon Docks, a technology centre. So we're really proactively looking at ways of actually meeting those needs. So I think any cluster to be successful and to stay successful has to innovate itself and has to take on these activities. Yeah. Without a doubt. I mean, Jan, in Berlin, you've got quite a successful stream of startups coming through. 
are they a product of the German education system or are they a product of the open door policy to the world? Um, we have a quite advanced uh, education system, but but I have to say one thing to to that. Um, I'm a sociologist myself, and I don't see uh, business schools as the first place to put in entrepreneurship education. Right. Entrepreneurship education is uh, a, a multi uh, facets. Uh, as it is, I mean, you need psychology, you need teaming, um, you need uh, a legal knowledge. So um, it, it means the effort of the entire uh, educational system of the entire university. Yeah. Okay. Now let's let's move on to the the role of governments more generally. Barcelona, uh, you know, city government's been incredibly active in, in creating smart city kind of technologies and, and welcoming, I sense, I guess, private innovators, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see? both the city government and the, the Catalonian government, the Catalan government playing a major role or do you think that's overstated? Uh, of course, the, 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 the city government has been playing this role up to now. We, as you probably know, we've changed the, the government uh, at the city level. It is not so clear now. Right. Uh, but uh, in any case, I think that the, the push that we have obtained out of the last years of, of certain uh, investment in, in these ideas uh, are paying off now. Yeah. And, and uh, we can see them now. Yes. Right? So you would, you would give the government credit? I would, yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, Christina, in Stockholm, how much, how much credit is <laughs> due for the Swedish government or the, or the city administration for that matter? Yeah, if, and if we talk about healthcare, you know there is a lot of laws and regulations that we need to <laughs> adhere to and uh, that's not all the time easy, uh, but we really need to live with it. Uh, but I think that the government wants more than maybe the laws can allow us to do. So we need to find a balance between what the government wants us to be able to do and what the law says that we can do. Is it, I mean, it's interesting you say that, you know, I mean, regulations are very important in healthcare. I mean, I, presumably, and the real world is that, you know, innovators are going to have to work within those regulations going forward. Isn't it better to have those rules in place and have clear boundaries and clear certainty? I think that is, but we have a kind of a gap between this is what we know we can do, this is what the law says that we can do, and how far do we want to move within this area where we can actually be sued? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, what you don't want is grey areas? No, exactly. Okay, fine. Yeah. Christopher, uh, Chris, in the case of Dublin, I mean, the Irish government has been very active. Extremely active. Um, and let, let me clarify that. I think it's really important that your, our mandate is to bring world-class companies into Ireland and get them essentially function there and, and be productive there. That's been their policy. Well, actually, there was, there was a recent KPMG survey done. I think 80% of the companies KPMG polled around, around the budget, around the budget time, which is last week. I think 80% said they were actually active in innovation and 30% said they want the government to do more. And they identified funding, they identified clarification of how some schemes work, and also talent pool, they want more talent. So I think the government has been proactive. I think we have an innovation 2020 science policy. We're going to basically double our percentage of science and investment in GDP. I think we have very, very good interagencies in terms of our, our Science Nation Ireland, which basically funds basic research. It's gone towards a policy where he's trying to connect companies to academia for productive impact. So I think there, there is a, a surge of trying to get this ecosystem to work better. And we are very open that we, we want people to, we want people business. I mean, um, Silicon Docs, for example, what drove that effect it was Google coming in 2003. Mm. I mean, Google came, we have Air, Airbnb, sorry, Airbnb, we have Citibank, we have Microsoft, we have LinkedIn, we have Twitter. I mean, you know, if you can anchor tenants into an area, you, you can grow it. And I think the last panel mentioned these innovation kind of clusters <laughs> happen by chance. I think that's been, been a bit... A bit <laughs> Not quite clear. I think we designed it and hoped it would happen, and it has happened. So right. I think we're credit to the government. They have done a lot, but there's a lot more to do. Let's just uh, uh, talk a little bit about the role of the corporation tax, and the, sure. uh, obviously very <laughs> controversial at the moment yeah, with the Apple situation. But what, I mean, what's the feeling in the world, the circles that you move in around that? How important is that corporation tax to attracting? Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's one of many things. I think it is important, of course, and you'd be fooled to think otherwise. I mean, but we also um, 
have a tax credit for R&D, we have a, a tax incentive on IP management and characterisation. We also ha have um, a lot of schemes put together by the government wh where companies can access research and get funding to develop really, really incitive and really beneficial um, activity. I mean, the, the government effectively when it, within Ireland have funded essentially through SFI um, 12 really innovative clusters in terms of technology. We've got um, in Trinity, we we're leading one on connected um, networks on um, intelligent content and on basically next generation ICT materials. So they are putting their funding where, where, where their actually is to fund these areas, to track these companies. But I think the biggest thing, biggest, the biggest, I suppose, challenge companies have in Ireland in the cluster is really, um, they want really talented people. They want to get them organically grown within the university system, which we're trying to do, and they want to bring them in. And that's where they want to be. I mean, if you've got a really good city, and I think Barcelona and other, other, other areas, that's really nice to work in, and really clever people, you'll do good business if so you haven't got those. People's more important than the tax? Um, I think the people, the tax, no, the tax is important, but the people important as well. People, I mean, you know, you can't take one from the other. I think that's been the <laughs> challenge. I think for my personal belief from the university sector, where I see companies coming in, I, I, I see them, what they really want is really good people. Okay. All right. I'm being a little bit unfair there. I wouldn't rank earlier, and I'm asking you to rank uh, <laughs> factors. But anyway, but, uh, yeah, in the uh, case of Berlin, I mean, we had one of the speakers earlier say it isn't, Berlin isn't really a public policy, a result of public policy. It's more about a, a, you know, a historical, cultural, cool city attracting dynamic young people. Yeah, right? it, it has something to do with the history of Berlin. I mean, it was divided into two parts, uh, east and west. It was united. Um, it was a very poor town, still is a very poor town. And... Um, it attracted a lot of young people, even in the 70s, a lot of musicians were going there, David Bowie and so on, uh, uh, making music in Berlin. So it, it, it had a kind of spirit, uh, it has the biggest art university in Europe. Um, so um, the, verse, uh, the basics were there and then it developed also by local policy uh, pushing that. Mm. Yeah, let's, let's just stay on that theme for a moment. How important is the cool factor, the, the status around a city, you know, is it, is it so, uh, can can governments create a cool factor? In London, we had the Cool Britannia campaign, etc. Barcelona is a, a cool city. Is that does that play a big role? Would you like to live in Barcelona? I'd like to live in Barcelona. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> it's, a, it's a cool city. So I might need a new passport. If, if, if I have to compare <laughs> how cool Barcelona is with the amount of investment from the Spanish government uh, that comes right. to the to the to the actual research and development. Um, not only in Barcelona, but also in the rest of Spain, I would stay for the cool city. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's no investment, there's no belief in, in the fact that technology and research will do something good for the country. But is there a way for... And, and you, can, you can see it from the, the statistics that you show in your report. The idea is that uh, there is a very low investment per inhabitant uh, in oh, research, yeah, 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 yeah. as you sh as you show there, and at the same time, uh, the talent of people doing research there is able to get a lot of money out of uh, the European uh, community. Yeah, yeah. So we are third in the rank of the list uh, of the ten uh, uh, cities, right? Yeah. So you can see that there is talent, good people as. You were saying, but do, do you think the, the city administration can do anything to create that cool factor, or should the, they just get out of the way? It can do something, but at the end, the city or uh, a, a, a region is made by the people who live there, and the way people are, the the philosophy of living, how people are understand life. That's very important, yeah. and this is something that takes. Uh, to other people uh, to get there. Yeah. Okay. Right. I think, David, there's yeah. a risk here in terms of a city being really cool because it gets quite expensive. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that, that's <laughs> another one. I mean, yeah, I think, that's I think, true. Yeah, Dublin is 47. I think um, Berlin and Barcelona are lower. I think London is obviously near the top. San Francisco, of course, is up there too. Yeah. So uh, I think, you know, the, the city infrastructure can make sure that um, affordable housing and personal taxation, those, you know, individuals workers as individuals and I think the city has to make sure good schools yeah and uh, um, you know uh, we, we, we would like the people who we bring into into the city well, eventually they have kids and grow up would go to Trinity and get educated 
personal wish. It might not happen. It could be UCD as well. There's good universities around around, the, around Dublin. Um, but I do think you know it's really important that that if we have this culture of a cluster, that the city takes an active role in making sure that it can develop and it, and it is maintaining a cost base. Let's. Uh, would you put housing cost as one of the, the biggest obstacles to Dublin's growth? Yes. Yes. Um, Let's, let's just go around the panel. Jan, what's the biggest obstacle in Berlin to further progression of the cluster? I don't see any obstacles. I mean, uh, <laughs> I just been over at the airplane reading uh, at its uh, magazine of uh, Brussels Airlines a big uh, article about Berlin's and New Silicon Valley. So this article wasn't seeing any obstacles. So I don't see any obstacles. <laughs> Do you, could you see that? I mean, I, I know housing costs are low at the moment. Yeah. But could you see that becoming a factor? That will become a factor. I mean, um, that's a major point of attracting young and creative people to Berlin because it's extremely cheap and yeah. compared to other European cities. And Do you think Brexit will help Berlin? <laughs> it's, it's a difficult question. Um, I mean, of course, a lot of British people come. I mean, I, I know that a lot of Jewish people will come to Berlin and already applied for, for, for visa and, 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 and things. So uh, it will have a positive effect in the beginning. Um, whether it will have a good effect on Europe, I don't know. Okay, all right. Christina, in Stockholm, any big obstacle that you would pull, you would particularly highlight? Well, I guess housing is kind of the same problems. We have big uh, problems with a lot of people moving into Stockholm. But I think that we should focus on what could actually attract people and you were into that, that uh, if we can attract people through high-ranked universities, uh, good ways of actually working after universities, so building this uh, hub for healthcare where we can actually provide very good uh, companies that work there. And we kind of uh, started that work when we, you know, you know, we're building this new Karolinska building, NKS, and we did innovation procurement. And there were a lot of interests from large companies like Philips, GE, Siemens, etc., in how they should actually move research and development to this area nearby, uh, Karolinska called Hagastaden, that you mentioned in the report. So, so uh, I think we should try to attract people and kind of uh, not see the problems. Yeah, no, no sure. <laughs> I'm playing devil's advocate to a certain extent, but I, I, how, to what extent is the tax, the high levels of personal taxation in Sweden? Is that. Is that an issue when you get foreigners coming to work in companies in academia? Is that putting people off? It probably is, but people also see what they can get from it. That you get a good education, you get good health care, you get a good social welfare. Yeah. Yeah, you only realize that once you're there rather than before yeah. you get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Josep, in Barcelona, any major obstacles that you're concerned about? Investment. As in venture capital? No, I think that venture capital is now seeing Barcelona as a mm. focus point. Mm. Uh, I think it's investment from the, the authorities, pu uh, politi political investment. You mean in the, uh, policies? In the actual infrastructure or? Um? Infrastructure is an important thing. Yeah. Uh, we have, uh, <laughs> if we have to talk about the comparison between the expenditure of the Spanish government in Barcelona and other places in the country, we could get into <laughs> independence topics, right, yeah. which I don't think are the topic here, right? But but well, but yeah. investment is an important thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I can tell you. Yeah, and that's partly because of the change of the political. Sorry. That's partly because of the change of the political. Um, uh, the well, the the city government essentially. Um, because you, I mean, you had quite a lot of. You've had the smart city project on the uh, the waterfront and there's, I mean the city's been yes, quite yes, active about yes adopting it, it still is yeah uh, we as a company are part of two very interesting projects uh, in in the the smart city yeah. environment right yeah. uh, so the city is still going for it uh, I think that the, the, the problem is with the basic investment that we need in many areas and it doesn't come that, that's a big problem. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about venture capital. I just touched on it there and, and the availability. It's often said that, you know, this is a, a major Achilles heel in Europe. But you've got, we've got four successful clusters on the stage. Uh, are you succeeding in spite of a lack of venture capital or, or is actually the venture capital issue, is it overstated? Is it, is it not really the big deal that it's made out to be? What about in Stockholm? Because you've got a, you've got a second generation of entrepreneurs there that are yeah. now investing in new companies. And funding is always important, but it's also important to get the funding in the right place to make it uh, fruitful. Yeah. Because if you put 
Sometimes if you put money into healthcare, it just disappears in a black hole. You need to put it <laughs> in the right way so it can actually grow innovation because there are a lot of ideas within the hospital and a lot of people that want to innovate, but uh, it's always in competition with taking care of the patient. So if you uh, share a project and they get money for the project, they spend a lot of time with the patient. Yeah. So you really need to find these constellations and doing it in a way where we can spend uh, the time with the clinicians in a very good way. Do, do venture capitalists in Stockholm, do they worry about healthcare? Do they see it as too hard, too complex? I mean, for the issues you're touching on, it's kind of easier to invest in a you know, a mobile app that's social networking or something. I think they think it's easier than it is. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's the, other, the opposite yes, problem. Yeah. And, and they want to do that, but uh, and they start by themselves, not involving healthcare, which makes it, oh, here is a threshold. We can't get any further. Yeah. So if they bring in healthcare earlier, we can help them to pass the threshold. Okay. Let, let me bring in Christopher on venture capital. Um, do, you, do you get, you know, promising startups heading off to Silicon Valley because they can't get funded? Uh, well, quite actually the opposite in some ways. Um, let me explain venture capital, how Trinity perceives it. I mean, about last year we looked at this problem internally and, and, um, and we decided that early stage venture capital was very hard to get. So Trinity and UCD, the other university in Dublin, got together with the EIF and put together a 60 million seed fund run by, uh, by um, Antic Bridge to try and seed early stage startups. So we're trying to actively manage that ourselves. It's not only one element. I think um, we also have um, Arch um, Venture Partners sitting actually in Trinity looking at new startups. And actually, I was quite interested from the healthcare side, and we've worked with a company called Infosome, which is one of our PIs that spun out. They've recently got 15 million for clinical trials. Um, Clary Therapeutics have put 95 million in terms of with, um, oh, um, I think it's actually um, Fountain Healthcare, I'm not too sure. So we, you can get sizable funding, but it is a real concern. Okay. And also the other side of the kind of course is that we're very concerned over companies. Uh, VCs have to exit. I mean, that's their role. That's their function. Uh, and, you know, how can you grow Google? Or, or I mean, you know, if, if it grows a certain size, they tend to be bought up. And we've seen that in 2014, for example, another statistic was that Enterprise Ireland, who funds all of VC work, they handed 14 of, of their companies to IDA, which is the, the larger scale investment, through basic acquisitions. Yeah. And recently we have Movidius, who's one of our star, star clients, uh, and was actually bought over by Intel. Yeah. So we are, we are seeing this, this, this challenge of getting the funding, but also getting to the Google stage yeah, yeah, yeah. with the exits. But yeah. that's, that's VC, that's what yeah. they do. And we see that in the UK to a certain extent with our and others. I'm going to come to the audience for questions in a moment, but Jan, just venture capital's played a big part in Berlin's success, and I think Berlin gets a disproportionate amount of venture capital. Uh, yeah, at the moment it's no problem actually um, for startups with a certain quality to, to get financed. But I have to say one thing, um, I mean venture capital also creates dependencies, um, and what we try at our university is to, to get the whole range of possible uh, ways to finance from crowd investing, crowd donating, angel investments, founding angels, and so on. Um, um, we shouldn't create for every startup a dependency on venture capital. Um, that's not the way for all. Yeah, it, uh, and t just on that, other sources of funding, EU grants, government grants, etc. Government grants, EU grants, and, and so on. I mean, Germany has a whole program of, of, of scholarships for, for young startups in a pre seed period. So um, it's unique in Europe um, and it works for Germany. It might not work in other countries. Okay, all right. Sorry. I, I would say that for. for local uh, startups in, in, in Catalonia, uh, I think that the most important business angels that we have are the families. Oh, okay. Basically because you find a lot of young people who are creating their own startup, uh, so the families don't care about uh, sort of supporting them for a couple of years. Uh, it doesn't make a big difference. Yeah. So they can still stay at home, save money, and devote their time to their own new business. So yeah. that's a very good way to, to sort of create an atmosphere that allows young people to And that's to doable because the costs of starting a digital company that's are coming right. down with cloud that's computing, right. et cetera, et cetera. That's right. Okay, that's let right. me just see if there's questions in the audience before we build on that theme. Uh, anybody got a question? I think we've got a microphone at the back. Okay, I'll give you a little bit more time to think about a question there. I, 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 I want to actually talk a little bit about the role of the government as a venture capitalist, i.e. government's actually putting venture capital in and actively seeding that market. 
Uh, one, of the people, one of the experts I spoke to for the report said, Europe has too much public venture capital and it's potentially crowding out the private sector. Any thoughts on that from the panel as to whether the government should be investing in small companies? I think that happens in Ireland, doesn't it? It does, yeah. It, it's one of, our, one of our, our, kind of our, our, our pillars in the sense that you know, we have a very strong policy where we want to see startups particularly being successful. Um, so the government w w would fund a number of ways. Um, in my view, the most productive way is, is where you have this university academic partnership where we try to either, either tr transfer companies to industry or maybe grow our own companies. So we would have activity in terms of launch pad and launch, launch box, which are kind of student and, and company incubators in college. Most colleges would. Around Silicon Docs, you have Dogpatch, you have Invent, you have Insights, so a few things like that. There's also then direct funding for EI, which is, which is obviously a government-funded activity. They have a large VC portfolio. And again, they want to basically move this forward. But I think you're right. I, I mean, you'd argue that um, companies should put their own money on the table. Well, I mean, and what's the exit strategy for a public venture capitalist? I mean, you know, how long should they stay in the game? You, you, you know, yeah. there's, there's a lot of questions around, this is public money. Where, yeah. You know, what's the, what's the end result? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, th I think um, f from my understanding, I think we'd like to see the companies go down that line further and hold the course a bit longer. Actually, we would like to grow our own Google, of course, you know. We, we, we but again, an exit is fine. I mean, you get a return on investment. I mean, the EI gets return on investment. The money comes back into the investors. But you would like aspiration to have these companies you invest in stay the course. Yeah, OK. Of course. Yeah, and you had a few reservations about private venture capital. I mean, how do you feel about public venture capital? <laughs> it's also a pro and cons. Uh, I mean, um, in, in Germany, a very small percentage of, of, of companies has this, uh, venture capital, uh, has this public venture capital. But what Germany does is in a pre-seed, uh, the first year, uh, the pre-seed period, of uh, handing money to young startups to get so far that they have a prototype and so on to, to, to get venture capital. Uh, and that makes a lot of sense. It takes risk away. Um, and uh, I mean, something will fail in the end of the day, but it isn't so much money. So you make a profit as, 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 as government, as state, as society in the end of the day. Mm. So I, th I think um, in a pre-seed, it makes a lot of sense to, to, to get money into that, into the process, into universities to support all this all the startups. Mm. Later on, it's, it's very dangerous. I, I see it as you. Uh, when do you get out there? Uh, what do you do with the money? How do you deal with failures? Um, it does raise a lot of questions, yeah. yeah. But I, I, I mean, the figures are surprisingly high. I think it's something like 45% of venture capital in Europe is ultimately from the public sector. Mm, yeah. so. The other side of the coin, of course, as well, is that these companies, startups, they need to have really really champions driving them. I mean, you need to have experienced entrepreneurs on their, on their boards, you need to have CTOs, CEOs. I think, you know, the venture capital is one bit, but people don't invest in an idea, they invest in, in a company, yeah. and that's leadership. Yeah. So I think you need to get the package right, yeah. and that's really important. Okay. Christina, I want to bring you in on, particularly on the role of seasoned entrepreneurs. I mean, you've, in, in Stockholm, you've had some success stories. I mentioned uh, Spotify earlier, you know, uh, um, Daniel Ek, et cetera. These guys are now investing in the, the next generation of of startups is that how big a factor is that i mean how influential are these guys and you know how important is it that they stay in stockholm um i think it's very influential and i know that spotify actually writes from kth royal institute of technology and of course it's an uh, uh for the students it's a very good um uh, what do you say uh that this is a role model for what they can actually achieve right so it shows it can be done. Yes. So I think that if you have the, you can actually have the brand, the school can have the brand of Spotify in, in, in a sense. So I don't know how important it, how, how important it is that it, they stay, but just that they have emerged from that school is quite important, I think. Right. So yeah, they, they blazed the trail. Yes. Essentially. And it's the same way as in, in the hospital where uh, the gamma knife and a lot of inventions have actually emerged uh, from ages back that we can actually ride on these things and say that we are innovative, yeah. we can do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Josef, on, on that theme, I mean, you've got some seasoned um, entrepreneurs in Barcelona that I think have stayed and become venture capitalists, etc. Is, is that an important factor or is it ancillary? Is it, it's like it is. Um, we we also have banks, for instance, that in, that have their their own venture capital, right? Yeah. Or or companies like Telefonica. The only problem with these big venture capitals is that uh, they only see the immediate benefit instead of understanding that 
venture capital should have uh, some sort of uh, time yeah. for the company to grow. Yeah. Uh, they they only see the immediate uh, benefit, and that 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 creates a problem. But if you're a seasoned entrepreneur and you've been there and it's taken you 10 yes. years to build a company, you get that. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Let's, uh, you, t you mentioned Telefonica there. One theme I wanted to touch on, I'm going to start with you on this, Christopher, is, is the role of big companies and uh, you know, the, the, how they can help a yeah. cluster to flourish. Whether that be a homegrown com uh, company like you know, uh, BMW in Munich or whether it's uh, Google in, yeah. in Dublin. Again, you know, what do you see as the role of big companies? How much should they be involved yeah. and how much should they let the ecosystem do its thing? Uh, I think I think it you know, was answered by, by Huawei earlier on, you know, that the company isn't there isn't there to, to have to hand feed the, the, the cluster, it's there to get a return from it. And I would argue that if they're in place and they're operating successfully and they're networking with university structure, they're creating jobs, they're creating um, innovation labs, they're bringing technology in through, through their global networks. I mean, they're doing a lot of really good activity, but I would like to see them more of a mentorship role in terms of our students. I think we do a lot of exchange programs to companies where we want to expose our students to real life. Right. Uh, and so, you know, a, a lot of schemes in Ireland favor that true exchange. Uh, I know, for example, Intel working with, with um, Trinity, but fire with their researchers in a lab working to try and spin technology in. We also place our researchers in, in companies. So I think it's, it, it, they have a, a role, um, and the role isn't much they want to get involved with. There's no pressure. But I think a good company should use the ecosystem and put something in and get something out. Yeah, it's give and take, Give and take, yeah. essentially. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, uh, interesting thing for us looking at Munich versus Berlin, a lot of big companies, a lot of big manufacturers in Munich, less so in Berlin. It, it feels like they're two different dynamics at work. Is that oversimplification? I mean, how big a role do the big companies play in Berlin? Mm. It's, it's, it's not a, a simplification. I mean, it's a matter of history. Um, um, a lot of companies, a lot of corporates were in Berlin before, after the Second World War. These companies moved by uh, dividing Germany uh, to Munich and other places in Western Germany. Um, it's, it's a different infrastructure. I mean, uh, Berlin um, is structured around uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, and is taking care of small and uh, medium-sized enterprises. Also, local policy is different. The universities act differently. Um, we have other corporations. We have one headquarter in, in, in Berlin, that's Deutsche Bahn. I mean, it's not the most innovative enterprise we, we have in Germany. So um, it's, it's different, and we have different structures of finance. I mean, of course, the corporates in Munich play a very important role in education, in, 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 in financing um, and startups. We find other ways to do that. So. It's interesting you can have those two very different dynamics in one country, though. Um, and that's partly because it's a federal system, I guess. And there's, yeah. a different, there's not that centralization that you might get in, in the UK or in France. That's, uh, the federal system plays a big role, but also history plays a big yeah. role. I mean, Germany was divided. Yeah. And yeah. Ber Berlin was isolated somehow, an island uh, in eastern Germany. Christina, in healthcare, obviously, the government and the public sector is a huge player in healthcare, you know, particularly in Europe. So ha the government, as a, a buyer of digital technologies, and uh, the government uh, or public agencies as, as actually taking a risk on something that a startup's developed. <laughs> How much willingness is there to do that? Or, you know, are they, I mean, you kind of alluded to it earlier, there's a lot of regulations, a lot of grey area. How much do government agencies want to stick their neck out and try something new? I think there's an interest in trying new things, but if it's a small company, that might be more difficult for them. Sure. Because on the long-term issue, how will they survive? Um, but there is a great interest in trying out new things. Right. So the willingness is there. And uh, the uh, you, that's there. the Swedish government in particular, you, you talked about that. I'm talking about the hospitals, yeah. uh, the health care. Uh, but it's a public system in Sweden. Yes, so yeah. yes. Okay. Chris, exactly. was, uh, sorry, were you going to... I suppose one, one comment I should have said really is that what, what companies have given um, universities and continue to give, they, they give us challenges, uh, which is really good, and they help us contextualise and also articulate our research. So, you know, you know in, Intel, for example, as I mentioned before, they, don't, they say, I want to do A, B, C, and D is fine, but they also ask, what are you doing, and how will that affect our next generation of products? So it's really important. It's a synergy. I, I think having Blue Skies research is really important. Having an applied research area where companies can influence and set really good challenges is really important as well. Yeah. And it helps drive the whole ecosystem. I think it's a balance. Yeah. And companies do contextualize what we're doing, which is really important to us. Okay. 
Uh, Yosa, I want to touch a little bit on, uh, you've got a couple of major global events in Barcelona. Yes. You've got the, the Mobile World Congress, which I have to go to for my sins. Uh, you, I think you've got smart city events, etc. as well. How important is it for Barcelona or other hubs to have that kind of global event kind of presence? I, mean, I think that they are paramount. They are very important. Uh, in fact, there has been a, an attraction of companies to Barcelona. Mm thanks to those events. They are a, a, a very nice and very good showcase for the technology being done in Barcelona at a very low cost. So you've got examples of companies that have come to a, that event and then later set up a, a branch or an office or... Or at least companies that are attracted to Barcelona in a, in a deeper way to understand what, what's happening there. Uh, there are associated events to the Mobile World Congress, like the Smart City uh, thing. Um, and th these are really important. Showcase yeah. the city. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Any questions from the audience? Uh, this lady here, and then I'll come to the gentleman back. So microphone. If you could say who you are, and if there's a question, if it's for any particular one of the panelists. Yes. I'm Gabi Lombardo, the European Alliance of Social Science and Humanities. I'm just wondering, uh, the spillover effect of these smart cities, I mean, I understand, obviously, the concentration of decision-making and business uh, and cultural activity and museum uh, created this vibrant uh, environment, but what is the spillover effect for the region, for example, Barcelona, for Catalonia, and so on? How far does it go, and uh, how you know, close to the city stay or how far it uh, travels. Okay, yeah, so uh, what's, the, what's the boundary around the cluster? Um, I, can, I can tell you about our case. Uh, we are now uh, not, uh, we are working with the city of Barcelona, but at the same time we are now starting to work with cities in the, in the industrial belt of, of Barcelona, uh, smaller cities, but that have an influence in the whole area. Um, there are quite a few industrial cities in, in the Barcelona surroundings, like uh, Terrassa, Sabadell, uh, cities that uh, attract a lot of technology. Uh, and, and I think that it's not just about Barcelona, but also about the whole region. So I think that the spill-out is, is spill factor you, you were mentioning is quite important there. Let's get one other yeah. example of that. Anybody else want to... Uh, Berlin, I'm uh, sorry, Jan, on Berlin, I'm guessing it's the cool factor probably resides in the city rather than the surrounding area, doesn't it? Yeah, no, uh, it resides in the city, certainly. Um, yeah. You don't have any surrounding areas. Um, but, but it also creates a lot of space. I mean, Berlin can grow. That's yeah. no, nothing right. around, uh, nothing stopping Berlin by, by growing. Um, but Berlin, I mean, we have a lot of, of connections uh, uh, to Eastern Europe and Western Europe cities. I mean, it's also history. Berlin was connecting Eastern and Western Europe um, somehow. That, that's also a factor on, on, on coolness, um, um, that it's, it's open in any direction. In the crossroads of Europe. Yeah. 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 Okay, this is a gentleman with the beard. Yes, thank you. Julien Blanc from Ex Marseille University. Um, I, I'm afraid we have put maybe too much focus on startups. Um, and, um, uh, and why I say that, it's because besides spin-offs and startup, what universities can bring to their surrounding clusters um, is um, direct collaboration, you mentioned in Innovation Labs, um, licensing uh, patents, or uh, to open their technological platforms publicly funded to SMEs. So I just wonder how you deal that sure. aspect uh, yeah. in your clusters and what is the opinion yeah. of the panel? Well, well, obviously, I mean, I can speak for Trinity College, I'm happy to do so. I mean, we have a whole portfolio of activities and you're quite correct, you know, we go from bilateral agreements to 100% fully funded projects, to spin outs, to licensing technology, to startups, to actually even advising people where to go for to find technology. So it is a much broader portfolio. We don't just focus on, on VC and startups, of course. Um, I think the university by itself, what, what, what is its output? I mean, its output is really good people and it's really good research. And you've got to find a home for those two things. So I think, you know, we have, we do large scale activities where we would work with, for example, um, one example that might be interesting is Huawei, for example. They are working with us on a smart cities initiative in Dublin, which involves three universities, four centers of excellence, and 28 partners. We're looking at testing basically various concepts from digital network within that infrastructure. So we, we do large scale investment programs like that. We can also work one to one with companies. We can also obviously then we have technology on the shelf. Um, an example of that would be where um, 
our friends on Google. And um, we, we had a technology which is really interesting. You know, the, the, the Google Cardboard, this, this um, VR system, you know, it's a cardboard box basically with a phone in it. If you look at that, the problem there was that um, the audio function wasn't, wasn't up to speed. So um, Trinity, through a guy called Frank Boland, who worked in Creative Technologies, licensed that technology to Google, and now that's in five million units, and it's downloaded 50 million times. And his actual team, who invented that and discovered that technology, they've actually relocated to, to Silicon Valley to the US, but Frank is actually working with Google locally in the Silicon Docs as well. Yeah. So you can have both sides of your client, yeah. and that was a multi million euro license investment. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm sure there's a couple of examples of that yeah. in Stockholm, isn't there? Of, um, it, where you've actually directly, you, uh, an innovation's come out of academia directly into, to solve a particular problem like that. Uh, I, I'm not really aware of, of that, but okay. what, I could, <laughs> what I could add is uh, that at KTH, for example, uh, when focusing on, there's a lot of healthcare research going on at KTH, and KTH has uh, gathered all that research together in order to be more uh, coherent and be able to collaborate with the healthcare side through this platform that goes over through all the schools. So I think the universities has a role in clarifying what kind of research that they're doing and where it can be applied. And in healthcare, you have uh, the medical universities have a tradition of being in the hospitals, but the other kind of research areas, it doesn't have that. And I think we have a challenge in bringing in technology School of economics, etc., into the hospitals in order to get research closer. Maybe that wasn't answer to your question, but no, 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 <laughs> uh, no, no. I think you hit the. Yeah. So you quickly, yeah, because we've got another question here. But yeah. Uh, well, uh, just to give you an example, for instance, the the the, the technical university of of Catalonia has been able to attract companies through not only th uh, as itself, but through the. Barcelona Supercomputing Center, okay, for yeah. instance. Yeah. But in, in our group, uh, one of the PhD uh, students of our group is now uh, uh, the founder of the CA Technologies Lab Research Lab in Europe. Uh. So, uh, and it, that is close to the university. So this is, this is just to tell you how the universities are able to create a, a network that, that really attracts yeah. And, and in that sense, the, it's, it's a very important uh, aspect. Yeah, the anchor of the cluster, yes. yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry, there's a, I think there's a question here, yep. Salvatore Roxas from the Commission. From, uh, and I would like to um, raise the attention on, on the in, in innovation system uh, aspect. Uh, those clusters look pretty much embedded in the local system, in, in the local innovation system. And I wonder whether they also managed to establish links uh, with other local and regional in, in, in innovation system. And I would like to understand if those links happen at cluster level, so at the level like in a coordinated manner uh, from the um, management of those clusters, or if it happens at individual level, so companies that are in contact with other companies uh, that help to strengthen the link between uh, uh, those systems. Okay, so links between clusters. Who wants to tell that? So, yep. for instance, um, in Catalonia we have Axio, which is the uh, regional uh, instrument for SMEs to, to have a support from the local government. And they certainly create links with different regions in Europe. And that's very important. That's very important because for the small and medium companies, SMEs, uh, having these means to get into uh, other knowledge, other technologies, other liaisons that, that allow you to, to grow, uh, this is very important. Are they, are they actually proactively doing that themselves? That's, yeah, that's true. For instance, they have an office here in Brussels uh, working uh, to network uh, universities and companies in the region right. uh, of Benelux with uh, Catalonia. Okay. And they are very proactive. They have offices in Hong Kong, Chile, uh, New York, uh, Los Angeles, all around the world. Okay, a very international view. Anybody yeah. else links on clusters? Um, yeah. 
<clears throat> I mean, it's a question, if, if you look at uh, uh, rather good universities in Europe, all are interlinked internationally, um, exchanging students, having international research contacts, um, exchanging startup teams. Uh, so um, I don't see the problem of being uh, so local. Um, I don't feel any local. I mean, we exchange students, we exchange stuff. Uh, uh, we have international research projects. Um, you cannot work local anymore in this globalized world. Okay. I think that's a very important, actually it's a very good question, it's an excellent question. Um, I think it's a lot of granular links. I think, for example, I know in our organ organization we're very involved in, in the European kick programs, the Marie Curies and Haste 2020 and so forth. So that's a really t hot topic and really important for us to actually exploit those and make networks. Companies also individually can ne next network, but I think it's, it's a really good question. I don't know the answer, but I'll throw it out to the audience that, you know, do you want to be another Silicon Valley? I mean, our strength is in our diversity and our critical masses that's, lo that's delocalized compared to one big chunk of California. I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting question and I honestly don't know the answer, but it's something we should debate more if we're going to go for this kind of local clusters that will essentially distribute the wealth and will connect through the various mechanism. How do we actually ma maximize that model as supposed to be in the Silicon Valley model where everything happens within, within a few square miles? Yeah. So it, it, it is a challenge for Europe. Uh, I think as a European and kind of program. It's really important we, we get the grips of that. I don't know the answer, but it is something we should basically ponder and make sure we get it right. Uh, for each of those entrepreneurs and researchers, there's a balance between doing the day job and, uh, and networking with other clusters and other regions, etc. You, you know, there's a kind of, yeah. you can only spend so much time. Yeah, but uh, entrepreneurs seem to don't run out of time. They seem to make time. That's <laughs> the kind of people they are. They work 24 <laughs> seven. You know, it, it's, it's, and it's like really good academics as well. It's amazing, you know, I, you know, academics don't work nine to five, either do entrepreneurs. When they get something that's their passion, they really go for it. Okay. And Europe as, 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 as an entity should be helping them to be succeed. Okay. That, that's our basic function. So we're, we're running out of time. I'm just gonna very quickly ask the panel, just a couple of sentences each, just how you see your cluster evolving over the next three to five years. We, what will change over the next three to five years? Yosef, yeah, yeah, so I can start with you. I think it will grow, uh, basically because we don't have, we, we don't only have the the uh, smart city cluster, but we also have a very important bio cluster uh, and also a very important IT cluster in Barcelona. Uh, we have a whole area of the city devoted to new technologies, and this, is, this really shows, and this really uh, attracts, and this really uh, creates a movement, creates a, m a momentum. Right. right? You've, got, you've got a critical mass. We do, yeah. Okay. Christine? Um, Sweden is a small country and I think that we will work more from the national side uh, and it's something that we're trying to do from the hospital side is to unite all the university hospitals so we look at things from the same side uh, because I know that there is a lot of organizations that wants to pull and drive things and I think if the hospitals and university hospitals aren't there to direct, we can end up with things that maybe healthcare is not uh, beneficial of. Okay. okay. Chris? I, I'd like to see us growing in, in scale and also excellence. I mean, I think it's really important that companies who are in the Dublin cluster innovate and continue to innovate and actually are successful. We'd like to see more of our, more of our own startups actually getting to a Google stage. That'd be fantastic. We'd also like to see people coming into the cluster and actually and even leaving the cluster and going to other clusters, I mean, that's a fantastic accolade to any network in Europe. If we can get diversity and exchange of, of entrepreneurs within, within clusters, maybe we'll have our Silicon Valley in five years' time. Hey, uh, just, sorry, just uh, on that, is, is, do you have a target for the number of unicorns? Is, that, is, it, as, <laughs> <laughs> is it as crude as that? Or, uh? No, no, we, d we don't have many apples, but I mean, unicorns are an interesting problem. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think, you know, I don't know of a target. I, I think there, there is a policy, there is num doubling the number of PhDs, all this kind of stuff and the government is seeding that. But you know, uh, who, who makes next thing's Google? It, it's an entrepreneur working 24 seven. And we gotta make sure that that environment's right for him or her to do their job well. Yeah, okay. Jan, funny? As the number of young people uh, increases day by day, you can really see that. Um, we have a push by, by getting now uh, industrial financed 50 new professorships in IT in, in, in Berlin. So there will be a push. Um, um, where it ends, I don't know. Um, I think Berlin will be developed normal in the end of the days and will be ex 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 expensive, ex as expensive as, as Dublin and, and Stockholm. So, uh, but that will 
take 10, 15 years. But as you say, you've got room to grow in Berlin. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah true. you've got land around you. Okay, uh, if you'd uh, join me in uh, thanking the panel for that discussion. That was uh, very interesting. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Very nice. I'm all right. Oh, you, you can say what's happening next. All right. coming with the good news. It's time to break for lunch. Uh, <laughs> I think you can smell and you could hear a little bit that lunch is ready uh, upstairs. Uh, please come back here at uh, 1.25, all right? And uh, we, ha we still have an exciting afternoon ahead of us. So uh, just one more thing, uh, the report, uh, you can download it on the Science Business website. Uh, we'd like to thank Huawei again for uh, commissioning this report. And uh, I think we are all free to go. <laughs> bon appétit. <laughs>